<laughs> Gravy alert. Hope you guys are ready to have breakfast for dinner because I'm sure we'll be ladling up all kinds of good stuff. We have Emily Moyer coming to her first Vibrant ever. I've seen her drop in in the live chats before, but we had such a good time on her show recently. And then not long before that, Emily did mine. So we're going to have a blast today. We've also got Tofu Gardner with us. I'm on her show recently. And then not long before that, <laughs> I hear myself coming back through Emily's. Uh, Maybe you have the stream open there. I, I muted you there. Recently and then not long. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I hear myself quite loudly. We'll let you sort that out. Maybe you got it open in another tab. But hey, Topher, thanks for joining us, my friend. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. We got some rain for the first time in like a bunch of months. <laughs> so my plants are super happy and I'm stoked. Sorry about that. I forgot that I had opened that window when I was sharing links with people earlier. And so since the stream started, that window activated. So, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I bet that made the intro music sound pretty weird. <laughs> Playing like over itself. How are you doing? Uh, like your skyline background there. Yeah, this is the um, chemtrail covered sky of the beautiful Ladybird Lake on the east side of downtown Austin. And um, yeah, I was just telling you guys a little bit about it before we hopped on. Um, so this is the, the lake that I talk about quite a bit, particularly in the shows with Michael. And um, uh, it's, it's actually the Colorado River. It's dammed up into several lakes all around Austin. But this one it used to be called Town Lake when I first lived here the first time. Now it's called Ladybird Lake. And I'm just a few hundred yards from Oracle. And I was telling you guys before we got on about that I think the Oracle building is actually the database, right? I don't think it's just like, oh, the place where the people work because I've been here for a year and a half and I've seen no person enter or exit the building. Um, wow. But it, it, it's got, like I have, I have lots of theories, <laughs> but I do know that they're in charge of the adverse events database. Mm -hmm. their adverse reactions database that they're processing all of that. And um, it, it, it feels to me like that sort of that, that, that this building was made for that project, right? Cause this building was made a little bit before the lockdown, they decided they were going to relocate from San Jose here. Um, and yeah, it's in like an interesting I was asking you guys before we started if you are familiar with Ibrahim uh, Karim's biogeometry, like his iteration of it, or um, radiesthesia. Like I think that his that building is in an area that is like negative green, which isn't necessarily negative, um, but it, it's a it's an interesting energetic spot, right? And I notice a lot of like anomalous things both with its placement. That's really common with like the corporate buildings here where they've chosen to locate themselves and location to the water for reflective possibilities. Um, but also just in terms of the cloaking abilities that come at certain times of day and the buildings look like something different than what they actually are. Um, and that one gets this very interesting green color sometimes and this interesting gold color. And my guess would be that if I saw it at the exact right time from the right angle, there would also be like a certain kind of ultraviolet so that you would have his sort of BG3, right? The, uh, the um, Ibrahim Karim BG3, which is the certain kind of violet, the negative green and the, and the, the specific kind of gold. Um, it's an interesting spot. Topher, you know a lot about the radiesthesia? No, I don't. <clears throat> so what I understand about the negative green is that like, so radiesthesia is where you are using mm, like uh, advanced pen pendulum devices and advanced dowsing type type techniques, right? Yeah. I think I'm hearing myself come back through somebody's uh, that doesn't have headphones in. That's all three of you, <laughs> but Gabe's muted. So maybe a slight volume decrease. <laughs> Slick is uh, totally omitted from blame, but... Yeah, the radio like radiesthesia color negative green is something that people that practice that say is a part of the like radionic spectrum or electromagnetic spectrum 
that has a, a bad effect on <laughs> organisms. It's kind of like, I, I'm not saying it's a one-to-one -one thing, but it's sort of similar to the Reichian deadly orgone. Okay, the door. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. It's very interesting because I live near the heart of darkness of all the Walmart servers. Like uh, Walmart has its monster servers in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. And I always have to stay in Bentonville before I fly out. And uh, it's crazy. When you're flying out of Bentonville, they have these four buildings. And the feeling I always get when you brought up that green color, I, I just kind of saw the Borg, you know, from, from Star Trek. In these buildings in Bentonville, there's, I believe there are four server buildings that are right next to the hotel that I have to stay at. And uh, they glow at night. They have this blue, this bluish glow. And I always joke that that's the Borg. And it's really weird. Like the pop-up neighborhoods that are all around there, none of the neighborhoods have trees. Like it's very, very, it, like it just feels terrible. <laughs> I, I, I can't stand it. You know, Walmart is an 88 in Gematria. <laughs> what does that mean? Sense. 88, that's sort of like a very mercurial kind of number. Okay. I'll just yeah. say that. Mercury has an 88-day orbit. Okay. Yeah. So my understanding of the negative green, and again, it was a couple years ago since I took, uh, it was just like a basic class with him. It wasn't like one of his deep dives, is that there's, there's different, like there's vertical negative green and there's horizontal and it, it depends on what is there as to whether it is good or bad per se. Like, I don't think it's just like totally negative green is bad, end of story, right? But you need to consider what, like with the, his, especially with his particular pendulums, they're very much, um, they look like some kind of really prismatic, interesting kind of sundial, right? So like where in the spectrum you're doing certain things matters. What might not be ideal for one thing might be excellent for something else. What might be unideal for a place to live might be wonderful for a place to have your business or, or what might be great for like, you know, a machine to work might not be great for your body to work. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily all bad. It's just, it's kind of like an Egyptian version of feng shui, right? Like that kind of thing. Like a certain color would be bad for one thing, but good for another or a certain angle. Right. So that was kind of the understanding that I got from the the class that I took from him, but it was, it was pretty, it was like part of an, a bigger workshop. So it wasn't just like strictly his stuff. Um, but yeah, it's uh it's quite a spot. It's very green over there though. There's a lot of trees. So whatever, whatever is over there, like near the lake, on the other side of the street from, from his building and whatnot. But um, it definitely feels like it has the cover of green screen. Like this whole area of the lake downtown feels like some sort of natural green street, green screen, right? Like I think that's what some of these, maybe even like, I don't know about all forests, but certainly like green spaces and cityscapes and stuff. I think they also have the capability of, of you know, some version of green screen technology. I'm curious about like what you mean by that in terms so, of how that would work. So Michael and I have gotten into this like a couple of times and it's one of the things that I, I would like to dig deeper on. The problem with, with Michael and I is that we each like pop off tons of ideas. And so like we've opened like every, every trap, every hole and every wrap, you know, portal and whatever. And you know, some of them I'd like to spend a little more time in and it. Sometimes we get excited when we get around each other and we just keep popping other ideas and whatever. But um, he lives in an area in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, that is very green. And um, we've done a lot of work on different areas that had a similar sort of landscape. And if, if technology is mimicking nature, right, I see 5G towers. I see trees as the original 5G towers, right? And then the sort of the, the entirety, the landscape, or maybe the the, even the, the grass or the lawns or whatever as some sort of like natural green screen upon which realities can be projected, right? And so you look at <clears throat> who hides in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Well, I don't know if it's hiding per se, but it's, it's the Amish, 
right? And they seem um, very disturbed by technology like related to electricity that's wired into a larger system. They're not anti-electricity from my research. They're anti-electricity that is fed from a metered utility, like, you know, city or, you know, something really large. Um, but that I think they use where they live as kind of like a cloak or a cover, right? So it appears to everybody else to be sort of one thing and to them it's something else. Um, but I think that they have a relationship with magic and technology that we have no idea about. Oh, Topher, let me unmute you, man. So you guys that don't have uh, headphones, <laughs> the best practice is just try to self-mute when you're not on. That way we don't get a little feedback. But yeah, okay. Topher, you were about to let it rip. Yeah, I was always under the understanding that all the groups that, at least with the the more Christian backgrounds, where I always get them mixed up: the Amish, the Mennonites, the the Quakers. I don't know if the Quakers fall into that, but it's the Amish, um, they saw they saw they see the that you know the easiest route for the the. Uh, luciferian energy is through electricity right and you're saying that that that's that to them it has to be grid tie is that like where you see is that your understanding well, i thought i thought what you said was true too but i started to dig into it because i was curious if they were escaping time by not using electricity right like if they were somehow uh, managing to live outside of of time and outside of the effects of whatever it else, whatever the heck it is that the rest of us all seem to be far more affected by than they seem to be. So I thought it was that, and I read like some articles and some blog posts and some papers and of a variety of kinds, and it seems to be that like there are some that are strictly anti electricity, and there are others that are like not they're they're kind of okay with like um uh generator type things or like they're okay with like non like analog technologies that need to be powered by electricity that is either like local to their communities right somehow so like something that they've rigged up but not something that ties them to the the larger grid um and and then there's also Amish that just use electricity and you know they're fine with people believing that they don't so it's just like everything else right it's just like every other like religion like Mormons are not supposed to drink alcohol or soda pop or whatever da, 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 but they do and you know whatever it is right so I think there's a varying degree of, of you know relationship with electricity um, but I think the big no-no for them is tie into a larger overall grid I think that they feel like that what you're saying, whether it's Luciferian or whether they see it as, um, I see it more like, uh, if you watch the more recent seasons of Twin Peaks, right? When you had these like hobo sort of time traveler dimensional things that traveled along the electric lines, like when, and you know, they seemed to have entered into our realm at the time of the atomic bomb or whatever. I don't know if that's, you know, but that, that seems to have been when that thing happened in Twin Peaks, but their 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 relationship is always to power lines. Yeah, that was the part of that show that was really fascinating. How he like goes into the gr electrical grid somehow. He sticks a fork in a power plug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and he electrocutes himself, but somehow it transports him consciousness wise across some kind of veil and. Uh, I know Topher's probably got tons of experience with alternate dimensions of consciousness and transitioning there. Well, I'm really <laughs> but I want to just say, like, there's this possibility of because energy and consciousness are kind of the same thing, and the consciousness of energy takes on the form of its container, kind of like water takes the shape of its container. I've thought for a long time that this larger power grid and this internet, and now the internet of things and all the further layers they're adding onto it are the they's building a body for their their Yaldabaoth Demiurge AI thing. I don't know. 
it it's really neat um so i was just i was talking with my wife this is such a great synchronicity just tonight she asked me about um we were talking about essentially power lines because when i lived in costa rica uh, Costa Rica for something like 35 years produced more electricity than they could use because they had all these dams. So they would sell their electricity to Panama, Colombia, and then also Mexico. But then it, it, while I was there, they were ended up being able to sell their electricity to Europe. And I, I started talking to uh, this huge, I started talking to employees of this, this company that had dammed a, a valley up in the mountains that I like to go to. And they were sending electricity back to Spain. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. How is that, you know, feasible with what I know about electricity? Like you, you would lose so much of your energy you know, trying to ship it across the world. And they, they were explaining to me, no, 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 no. The, 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 the way the grid actually works is, and Ken Wheeler is really good uh, explaining this. I don't know if you guys ever f follow uh, Theorio Apophasis on, on YouTube. Ken Wheeler, uh, he calls himself the, like the big fat bald monkey. He has something like 7,000 videos um but he explains it really well the, what all these turbines and generators however they're however there's these big magnet arrays are spinning in these coils all they're doing is pro actually producing voltage at a certain frequency well voltage is potential and the conductors the the lines that that carry that potential are con they're made out of conductors and conductors don't really do work. And what's actually, they were, <laughs> I have so much to say about this. I, I'll, I'll keep it simple. But like the, we live in pure potential. And so these lines that can actually collapse, that can um, allow a current to run through them um the frequency it's sort of i kind of think of like tuning forks the frequency and the uh amplitude of whatever is needed on the on the secondary side that creates a resonance that actually collapses the the potential around the field and then a lot uh, or excuse me around the conductor and then drops the energy into whatever is driving the load and so it's i really think they're trying to over when i say they <laughs> the as i see it these massive massive lines because i saw them putting in these million volt lines all throughout costa rica they tried to run it over my, my farm and we were able to stop them and they they went to the valley across the way it completely changes the energetics of the area the, the really, really high voltage, it, 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 it like, it creates the door that you were talking about chance. It puts like, off a huge field. Yeah. It's just like, it, it's antithetical to life. It lowers the qualogenic effect of the, of the water. And what we saw was wherever. Can I interject a question to add to what you're talking about? I want to ask you something to see if this relates. You were telling. I think it was when you were on Rob Edwards podcast or Baldi's. I don't remember which, probably Baldi now that I think about it. But you were saying that in Costa Rica, they changed the building law so that people had to make rainwater flow to the road. Oh, yeah. It's the and the roads are usually power lines that go along roads. Exactly. So do you think there's a connection there? I think, I mean, that is just like the, the absolute most absurd I, I'm still upset because I'm still involved with the project down there. I think all the laws are actually there to make make the quality of everything drop to such a level that nobody wants to be there. Yeah, that's just a really you were going in on that whole thing, and it's crazy to think about the energy it would take to make the water go 
uphill when it would naturally just run to a river or a stream yeah i was so i, and I that, was, that I, dor I was, might I, be in getting into the water and then that water's going where it goes i had i had like really righteous anger with with the with the the superintendent for the municipal there because he was trying to tell me that this is for the environment and i was like the most energy intensive thing on this planet is pumping water so now you're going to say, instead of us gravity feeding water, water always finds the lowest point. Like, how how can you say this is for the environment when you're going to have most people pumping water continuously up to higher points where the water is then going to go to a lower point beneath them? I'm like, it's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. And to me, it's a it's a it's a law that they're that or it's a it's code that they're enforcing just to steal land because the whole thing with agenda 2030 is to just give you all these codes and if you don't have land rights if you don't have real land rights they'll just take your they'll take your land and it, now in costa rica they've that's a new thing it's like if you're breaking code they can they can lawfully enforce you to to be not on your property where in the past that wasn't the way they could just find you in the past, but now they can literally come there and get you off the property until you, until you uh, come into code. I'm still not fully sure. I understand how electricity gets to Spain. <laughs> well, they have all so these massive, the, the whole thing, the part of the thing that made some of the flat earth stuff. So relevant to me is I, I, they have these massive cables all across the ocean. And one of my one of my girlfriends in college, her father was responsible for laying the line all the way from South America to Australia. Okay, that's wild. And so in 1995, we had a party down in the Keys because he was finally done after seven years where they got the cables finally to, I forget what what big... Eastern Seaboard City on in Australia, but now now the the service lines were totally connected. So when people talk about GPS and they talk about satellites and all this stuff, and no, all the trunk lines for the internet are all running under the ocean. It's funny this this is the third second third day in a row that that has come up that topic about the cables underneath the internet underneath the ocean has come up uh you know which is never i think maybe one time years ago when i was talking you know i was with randy something like that came up um and also it was weird i was food porning before we started tonight and looking for where we're gonna have dinner this weekend and like some fancy restaurant had literally an entree breakfast for dinner which is what you opened this with chance right so <laughs> <laughs> so the, the synchronicities are big and small. I think there's also, well, I want to address the moving electricity first, right? Like there was a time when we would have thought it was impossible to. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, I need to jump in there because I'm not being totally clear. What I'm trying to say is there is no movement of electricity. There are no electrons flowing down the conductor. I just want to be clear about that. What the conductor does is the conductor gives the signal and then wherever the field need, needs to collapse, it collapses in that local environment. Like the whole model that's given about, you know, electricity is producing a generator here and the electrons move across, like all the, the big heavy hitters in electrical engineering, like the people who made it possible, they were all anti-electron, <laughs> which doesn't mean they were proton. None of them believed in electrons. So their whole thing was that the, the, elect, the field, the, the better way of saying it is the ether, ether's potential, the ether collapses around the conductor when it's needed. And then that's, that's what actually, there's an induction current that then drives the load. So just, I just wanted to be clear that there isn't electricity flowing down the lines per se. Yes, I, I didn't. I didn't think that that's what you were saying. I was actually going to point to 
Um, and I think we talked about something related to this when, when you were on with me, but the technologies like what you're describing were displayed in the TV show Fringe, right? About they were trying to figure out how they were gonna quote, move a tremendous amount of energy from here to there, but, you know, disparate places across the world. And it all seemed to have to do with the sound and a vibration. And then suddenly what had been here was on the other side of the world. There was like no lengthy process. It was just like getting the vibration going, right? And then getting two things sort of in some kind of harmony and then that was sort of it. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of, I don't think we understand any of this stuff. And I think that there's a variety of ways things can be done and different groups are partial to, or different factions or, or different, however we like to think of the they, the many different they's. You know, th these people have this preferred method, these people have this preferred method, that preferred method, um, you know, and so, but I think that all the ones that we're told, like that are, were given as like the obvious answer are like either the stupidest one or not it at all, right? Like, you know, so um, to your, uh, point about the 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 stuff with the the land and moving everybody off of it and all the codes and stuff like that like some of this stuff just seems like beyond dumb right like i work in restaurants which are very much i mean i have for a long time i'm not actively working in one now but some of the code things are so stupid right like it makes no difference for anything pertaining to anything but it does allow there to be a monopoly of restaurants that are owned by conglomerates and groups and whatnot, which is exactly like the, you know, the Agenda 21 stuff. And they'll make one rule and you'll adjust your restaurant to it this year. And then the next year, they'll literally change it back to what it was before. So you're now taking off the thing you just paid to put on. And, you know, it's just, it's endless to the point where you're just like, I'm done. I'm going to sell my restaurant to this bigger corporation for cheap, which is exactly the same thing that they're doing you know, with, with, with the land. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's busyness and then it's also just demoralizing. Nice. Yeah. So, it, it, um, I've been thinking about the term planned obsolescence and how it doesn't, for one, it didn't get enough airtime in its day. And at this point, it's almost like we need a more, uh, descriptive term for it because it's so commonplace that it's all the way down to those little details. Like you got to change your menu to accommodate this, whatever, this code or this new standard that just in time for them to revamp whatever that's based upon. And now you got to, and then it fuels all these uh, incumbent industries down the stream, like the people who make and laminate your menus. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's like a death by a thousand paper cuts kind of thing eventually, you know? Uh, but also on the thing, like with what Topher was saying about them taking people off the land, I just want to highlight that uh, that common depiction of Saturn cutting the feet off of Mercury in the old wood cuts. Uh, oftentimes Saturn is using his scythe to remove Mercury's feet, uh, which uh, is indicative of a debt-based system that is always uh, stealing from the future generations uh, to accommodate for whatever the Saturnian powers of the time might be. Uh, but yeah, I think all of those, that's, these are ancient systems that are pre-electricity, <laughs> but somehow they're still standing in our current truth, uh, symbolically and uh, technologically as well. I'll just weigh in. I've not brought it up for a while, but the ideas of Tracy Twyman, which I think all all of us here are familiar with, the uh, <laughs> money grows on the trees of knowledge. Yeah, book. Tracy, my girl. That big weave that she gives on how the possibility that the velocity of money in a fiat debt-based society uh, economically, where all the money is, act is actually debt and thus is like, stealing money or stealing energy from the future in a way. And there's so many other things about our society set up that is stealing the energy of the youth or the potential from the future or something like that. So with the whole <laughs> Amish not being connected up to the grid, well, what's 
everybody a lot of times worked up about in terms of what's attached to their house is the meter, the meter that's counting up all the time and how like the more electricity, the more technology is invading our lives in a way. And we're taking it on willingly, I should add, but Can it, I tell you, you know, me? we're using more electricity. We're running up that meter. The velocity of, of uh, trade is what she theorized actually made the increase in the flow of time. And that is velocity in the sense of how much money is traded around how fast and how many transactions. So in a way, like the <laughs> it maybe it has something to do with all these records getting constantly made in every little thing in the internet of things is going to be taking more notes and making more records and more micro transactions on this future blockchain too, that is also tied into the economy and the trading of currency if you will or current which is electric i don't know makes me wonder if that is why the amish have stayed similar to their with because the passage of time isn't what we think of it is in the sense of like how do you get out of time maybe it isn't that you actually freeze time and the earth stops you know having days and nights and you're just in one moment forever what if getting out of time or slowing down time just means getting out of the flow of artificially induced evolution which is the change over a period. Whereas, you know, at one point humanity appears from what we can tell to have been living in kind of a perpetual cycle and not having quote unquote evolution. <laughs> and you know, the secret societies and mystery traditions are all about evolution. They give it to you in the form of scientism in one way, but the like Crowley characters or even Darwin's inspiration for the idea of evolution came from all the talk of evolution from the mystery school side of things. So who knows what's going on? So a couple of things sort of popped to mind. First of all, I think there's a credit union here in Austin called Velocity, right? <laughs> so they're just not even hiding from it. Um, but I think that it's, you know, I think it's possible, what, like the kind of thing you're describing certainly is possible. And if there are, you know, we're not 100% clear on what the overall ethos of, of, the Amish are in relationship to this, but maybe it's just if they're creating their own closed system, right? So the current is staying in their system, but they're they're using electricity. Maybe it's sort of about that, right? Like not having all these things connected to other things. And, you know, you wonder if having like a closed system creates almost like a closed temporal bubble, right? And then so you have like your city power, you know, you have like certain electrics, you know, electricity things that are just like block by block or building by building. And then others that are like the city power. And then there's things related to the state. Like before I, right before I moved to Texas, there was like the big freeze and there was the huge problem with all the power. And they were talking about the state grid of operator was, you know, it, problematic and this and that. So there's like the, the city block, the, the whole city, the, the state, right? And then there's grids that are sort of operating between states and whatnot. And it creates like this a system where time is not sort of localized or centralized. Everything is affecting everything else. And it's kind of like the difference between having your intranet or your mesh net just with your neighborhood or like the internet where like everything is all connected. And, you know, maybe they're very well aware that if you connect to other people, places, systems, times through electricity, then that is like, that's, you know, that, that, that's actually the problem, um, not the electricity per se. And as per the, like the, the time traveling hobos and, and the things we saw with electricity in Twin Peaks, um, I had a really weird thing happened with some power lines. Uh, and I've told this story before, but in light of what we're talking about right now, maybe it's slightly different. So I, we're at this place about 30 miles north of Palm Springs called Hidden Passage Ranch, right? And we were staying there for a couple of days. We had like a little tiny house kind of thing on a property that had like a few different tiny houses and then like a pool that everyone on the property could use and all of that kind of stuff. And we had been sitting outside like on our little porch all afternoon because it was close to the pool. And um, there was nothing like in front of the porch. And then later that evening, we were having our psychedelic stars experience and all of that kind of stuff. And suddenly it looked like there was like a wall with like 
hyperdimensional graffiti on it. And then we started to see like lion's faces and it, it looks very like simultaneously like high tech and futuristic, but very tribal kind of thing. And it's like, was there a wall there? <laughs> like, did we miss something or whatnot? And in the morning, like after we woke up and the sun came up, all that was there was power line. There was one power line going this way, like two power lines coming together. And that where those two things came together, it like made this whole crazy looking thing, right? And I wonder if there's energies and other, you know, all kinds of energies and spirits that can travel along that, you know, those lines, or if somehow where the elect the two electric lines meet or what, I don't know if it was like a phone line, an electric line or whatever it was, if it sort of opens up a door to like what has been in that location before or what may be there later or whatnot. But it felt like, you know, very, um, it had a super like really ancient sort of like a prime primal kind of feel to it. That is not what that place feels like right now. Right. Um, and it was like unmistakable. It wasn't just like, oh, something you see out of the corner of the eye or whatever, right? But it was at, it was on those electric lines and those were the only electric lines in the area. Like the, pole, the wooden pole posts or poles were like pretty far off from where we were. That makes, it makes a lot of sense. Like, so you have conductors, right? And maybe what the Amish are thinking is the longer the conductor is, the more noise to signal you'll have. And what they're trying to, do is concentrate their signal you know their signal is their concentration is their power is their safety but, but what about this to tover you know how like ancient astrologers would cast a birth chart for a place like a city whenever it came in like they built a city and this was the day it was founded or whatever and it's got a birth chart and so there's this idea of the egregore of place right. and if you have a large, you know, world spanning actual physical cables and interconnected energy fields, is that creating an egregore of place that is like the whole place? I don't know. Is that yeah, what globalism is about? So is actually sense. like, you know, like creating this God? That makes so much sense to me. Well, also, like, let's just say that I was getting. Um, some of this special electricity from Costa Rica, right? <laughs> that, that we need to import from there. Like, what if it was bringing with it, right? However, it is moved or created or whatever, the sort of energies or sort of ethos or the sort of, you know, that that, that spirit of that kind of place, right? Um, I, you know, Palm Springs is an interesting place, but these seemed more like jungle kinds of animals or or something, not what you would see. It weren't wasn't Palm Palm Springs kind of animals, right? At any time that I'm aware of. So it would be interesting if when we're getting electricity from someplace far away or getting water from someplace far away, what else is being brought with it besides just the things that we think of obviously? Like water's bringing hydration. It's probably got some minerals in it. It's got probably a lot of pollution or whatever. But like what else energetically is it bringing with it? Good, bad, or indifferent? It's bringing its noise. That is true. Yes. It, Which is, yeah, it, dissonance. Exactly. It's bringing the etheric noise. And the longer the distance, the more noise there is. So <laughs> there's a couple of things that are on my mind right now. First of all, what you're talking about with the electricity doesn't really flow. It doesn't like move from point to point. <laughs> it's just the potentiated ether concentrating in one area, sort of. I'm really paraphrasing and maybe not getting that exactly right, but it makes me think of what I do with the forks and why maybe a, a bit of an explanation of why and how that works, because the sound is electric. It's just on a different part of the vibratory spectrum than the light, but you know, lightning and thunder is the same thing. So there's that. I'm going to want to learn more about this alternate view of electricity and how I can apply that to understanding what it is I do. Because I know what I do works, but <laughs> it's still like it's better if I can conceptualize it as well. Ooh, but now, ooh, in terms ooh, of like ooh. this big for being that I was talking about, this egregore of place of the globe, the so-called globe, right? Uh, the whole the whole realm at once. Think about how technology has influenced human beings. You know, just having this on us and being in the environment surrounded by it is changing us in a lot of ways. 
maybe the goal here, you know, think about, okay, technology being a plagiarism of what nature has already got. So nature's version of it would be maybe the ley lines and an early attempt to hack that grid for good or ill maybe is all the, you know, temple and cathedral building on the ley lines. But perhaps this more, <laughs> more noise version with the actual cables that are going under the ocean and connecting everywhere, everything, everywhere, all at once. Maybe the goal is to actually like uh, replace whatever the consciousness of the realm is as a living being itself with an overlay or an artificial, like, you know, basically demonic possession of the whole earth, <laughs> like literally the earth itself, not just the people on it. Sounds just crazy enough to be plausible. It makes complete sense to me. I mean, you know, like any time dealing with like, you know, let's just call it extracurricular spirits. All they're doing is infesting you with noise. It's just the noise of their, you know, disembodied whatever. And so, and then when the, like, whenever I, I've been in a very clear space that I've been closer and closer to silence, like pure silence. And so in areas that I've been in where like deep in the forest, in the rainforest or, you know, other areas like way out in the ocean where there isn't this electrical influence there is a considerably easier time to drop into silence. Like, at least for me, the way my body's built, like I, I can drop into a much more deeper, still silent space when I'm not having all this electrical interference. So a couple of things i i do i've done a couple of interviews with this guy and i've been listening to him for years his name is lookout for charlie and he is a odd sound person like he's you know he's really into sound and he he does what he'll do is he'll find like uh, audio clips or video clips and he will like raise the volume of things that you can't like normally hear and what you will find behind everything else is this like he calls it an rf weapon it's basically like this sort of background field of noise that is consisting of like all kinds of things including like these chatterbots right and like people will not hear them but they will be responding to them and how he discovered this was he had a friend staying with him for a couple nights and sleeping on the couch in his living room and he came out to the living room and she was like full on talking in her sleep, like not just like a word or something like that, but like having like a complete conversation in her sleep, like she was talking to somebody. And so he the next day, like it happened again the next day. So he decided to get, a, you know, a recorder out so he could record it and she could hear it. Right. And so when he was playing it back, like he played with the levels a little bit and he found some interesting sounds and vocals in it that were literally the other part of the conversation. So she was literally responding to things she was hearing outside of like the normal perception being able to hear, right? So he goes through, He, I mean, it's fascinating the things he finds when he goes through and listens to video clips from random events and different kinds of things. But what he told me is he thinks that like this is uh, this exists in the field, like in nature at large in general. Like even when you leave like the city or the electric environment, then you have like the background sound field of nature, which might consist of the water running, like the, the, the leaves rustling, you know, little squirrels running through the forest or whatever that creates its own harmony or its own hum that like you'll get used to it and it becomes sort of a rhythm you're used to. Right. And then other sounds might occasionally come in and ping off of that, even if they're completely nature that that exists. And then there's all these things that have overlaid on top of that, some with the intention of using that field and others just, OK, they were creating this technology and it starts to interact with it. But he says that there are parasitic frequencies that find like certain sounds that they're able to run off of. So like I like. I was telling him like it's weird sometimes when i'm in the shower at my house in los angeles like when i turn the water on it sounds like there's like a siren coming through 
the, the water. And other times it doesn't sound like that. And he's like, yeah, what it probably is, like next time that it happens, go and check and see if your neighbor's car is parked in their driveway close to you that day or if your car is parked in the driveway. And, and, and then one day when it's not, sometimes there's like some piece in a car that one of these frequencies will hit and then it bounces. Like there's all this whole like background symphony of stuff going on. But that's why I would hear it sometimes and sometimes not. And he said, this is going on all the time, all the way around us. And then people have built technologies to bounce off of that and use for a variety of things that maybe we would consider nefarious. Um, but it's like an entire field. It's not like a weapon that's beamed at people like a lot of people think. It's not, it's not that it can't be directed in any way, but it exists as background noise that some people are more sensitive to, or they're near something else that it's bouncing off of that's exaggerating it. Man, there is so much here to work with. Uh, so I've seen city planning uh, graphics. Uh, particularly, I was in Boulder, Colorado, and I was looking at the way that they have the grid for the zoning of the city. And it struck me immediately uh, because I was at the time learning about magic squares. And uh, I'm pretty dialed in on the magic squares. I've got a lot of them memorized. Just for anybody, just to kind of give some brief overview, like anytime you hear alliteration, but, uh, which is, gen you know, it predates Shakespeare, but Shakespeare used to use a lot of alliteration. And when you use alliteration, you're doubling that first letter. And what that is, is a invocation of a magical square. So one example is like R and R. An R and R is a nine by nine magical square of the moon. And so you, you go from the letter to Gamatria and you're, double, you're using it twice. So you're invoking the moon when you do R and R. When you do WW, uh, like world wars, that's a five by five magical square of Mars. So World War is invoking Mars, the, the god of the war. And so that's just kind of a, a, a rough overview. But the thing is, Boulder was a six by six. It was 36 squares. And each, each square of the city is, I believe, I think one mile. It might have been six miles. It might be, so each little block is a six by six. Uh, so you got the macro and the micro because it's six by six little blocks in the squares of the grid of the city. And so the way that each city is plotted out becomes an offering to a certain divinity. And this is all hailing back to Chaldean mathematics and uh, you know uniformity of the systems. So, that is not to say that each city is going to be a magical square of the sun, which is six by six is magical square of the sun. You might live in a city that is a four by four magical square of Jupiter. And once you get your head around those city maps, then you can see the fundamental intention that was put into your city. And then you put it next to the name of your city and all kinds of truths and consistencies might be revealing themselves. So I just thought I would lay that all out because that's some of the things that are going through my mind uh, as we have this conversation. Uh, and it also makes me think of like, you know, in uh, Black Panther, they had that, uh, that three-dimensional uh, means of scanning a terrain. And it was like a plate of sand and they would turn on, flip a switch and the plate of sand would become topographically impeccable. And you could see like cars driving, you know, so that's what I think we might be talking about uh, disguised I, as I the think that technology actually, I mean, so the the experience I had with this is sort of anecdotal. I don't know if it's a one to one, but I, I, I can I think I can confirm that. Uh, in 2007, I was building these orgone accumulators and um we got we got the orgone accumulators to resonate and when they resonated all of our heart chakras opened in in this house in my ex-wife's in-laws house in downtown palm beach gardens florida 
And it was really an amazing experience because there were a bunch of people in the space that were huge skeptics and had a lot of doubt, but we all felt it. And it was like, whoa. And then the next morning when I woke up, I, I went to go make some coffee and our friend came in from outside and she's like, Topher, there's a, there's a black chopper over the house. And so I walked out there because I couldn't hear anything. And it was one of those, you know, silent whoop whoop choppers. So we got really freaked out. Like we were like, what, what happened? And we were getting all this technology ready for Tesla tech out in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. And so we actually drove to Austin that, that very next day. <laughs> uh to you know do further testing but what was weird was while we were out in albuquerque uh we brought this up to some old timers that did everything by snail mail so this links back to everything that we're talking about they had zero electronic communication with each other i think the youngest the youngest gentleman in that group was like 78 years old and um i i befriended one of the guys and he's he was he he was a contractor for nasa he didn't work for nasa nasa would hire him to do like all these scientific experiments and this was yeah he he told us and then the next year we saw him again at tesla tech he the next year when we saw him, he said, you know, he goes, have you guys seen the new Batman? And this was the Batman with um, what's his name? Heath Ledger that died. And in, in that Batman, they show that there was this technology where they could like cross, you know, correlate all the, the cell phone signals to create like a sonar in in real time and get, you know, 3D imaging in real time. But when we explained our situation to him with what we were doing, he was like, oh, yeah, you guys made a clean spot. So when you got those cells to resonate, it, it created a clean spot in, the, in the, and they were calling it a Tesla dome. It says every city that's gridded out has essentially what's a, a Tesla dome. And that dome is full of noise. And whenever there's a higher consciousness thing, whenever there's something like that has a ton of orgone or a ton of prana, it opens a clean spot within that Tesla dome and they, they pinpoint it immediately because it's so rare. <laughs> they know exactly where it is. And then, I mean, they were on, a, they were, we only ran that, our, our cells were only resonant for maybe 10 minutes that night. And they were right over our house. Dude, so, forget, Palm Beach is the corner of the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So a couple of things. So the magic squares, I'm interested to hear more about them and how they relate to cities. I'm pretty... I don't want to say I'm obsessed with zoning because obsessed. if I said I was obsessed with it, then that would imply that I've done far more research into it than I've actually done. But I'm obsessed with the, uh, the idea and one particular sort of iteration of it that I've become aware of. Um, there's a gentleman named Edward Murray Bassett that my attention was turned towards, who is the father or the godfather of zoning. He coined the terms freeway and highway. And, you know, he was basically the person who started to convince cities and municipalities and whatnot to start, um, you know, doing particular types of, to, to start employing zoning and making laws and rules about how, how things would be laid out and where. I'm also simultaneously, but slightly separately obsessed with this concept called urban spatial order and these grids that you can look at to see how different cities are arranged around this sort of mm, pole kind of thing like it show it's fascinating to look at i look at it from the perspective of like um if there are cities with um similar or harmonious spatial orders to one another are, is there a, like a connection that can be made that allows for travel outside of the standard means and whatnot i've, I've looked at these 
urban spatial order disks kind of sliced apart. And like, I, I like the, like trying to move one over and put one sort of on top and align it to another city and see where that connection point may be and whatnot. Um, but as far as the squares go, one of the things that I, I don't know if you've heard me ever talk about the idea of um, city blocks as QR codes and that the obsession with the QR code, particularly like what was the first thing that we all had to start doing once lockdown started, at least if you lived in any kind of place where you were still like trying to order from restaurants or whatever, everybody's participating in this sort of practice or this ritual of scanning the QR code, right? And if you look at a city block from up above, right? It looks like exactly like the QR codes do, right? And I sometimes, in fact, there are buildings in, in some cities that have QR codes on top of them. Who the fuck is scanning them? Is there like some giant race of beings that have their cell phones out and they're literally extracting information from the city blocks the way we're extracting information from geometric magic squares on pieces of paper or on other people's cell phones or whatnot. And so when you take that and like put that together with my ideas as of buildings as being technology, a lot of them, not, I mean, all of them are some kind of technology, but advanced technology that is collecting information, right? And like moving it up to the top to be sort of scanned and picked up and whatnot. Like I imagine like in my like most cartoonish vision, I imagine some like giant Tartarian beast walking around with like an enormous cell phone, like scanning apartment buildings and collecting the data of the people that live there to know like what he wants to eat for dinner, you know, who he wants to eat for that, you know. But I also wonder like if this is, if there are, giant ships or giant mm, weird sort of plasma beings or whatever up there, like, are they not able to, to pick up information that way to, to sort of scan something like, you know, the way, you know, you can walk by if you have good intuition or if you're good at certain kinds of intelligence and you can look at someone and you can scan them and you can retrieve a lot of information. Right. Like what if you could retrieve the information of like the entire city block at once or the entire city, just like we right. do it from like one menu. Right. So this makes me think of Star Wars. Uh, just going to throw out there an image of a statue with hieroglyphics on it that it's not the way we do QR, QR codes, but it could be a similar thing. Damn right, brother. Yeah. 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 So that makes me think of Star Wars. And, uh, you know, could this go back to uh, that that far back that we've been at it for so long. It also makes me think of the fact that the word building is twilight language for the bell ding. And we all know that every time you hear a bell ding, an angel gets its wings, <laughs> uh, which is much like an exchange. Uh, when you scan it, when you scan the QR, uh, there's an exchange, a mercurial uh, exchange point. I have a question about the magic squares and their relationship to Sudoku. Um, I went through a period of time where I was like really, really into Sudoku and I'm terrifyingly good at it. Right. Like, like if I see somebody, like when I was living in a city, like where you take the oh, cell mind. <laughs> where I like if I lived in a city where like you would take a bus or a subway or something like that if I like saw somebody three rows up doing a sudoku out of the corner of my eye like my mind was already like doing it I had to stop doing them because it was invading my dreams like I was having dreams of like large sudoku boards that were like the size of like um you know four square boards or just hopscotch or whatever and that I was doing some kind of like physical capueta Sudoku with like, you know, ideas instead of just numbers. And like, it was like literally something was counting and whatever in my sleep. Like I had to stop doing it to stop that. And I don't do them anymore except for once in a while if I go on a plane trip and then people will look at me like, because <laughs> it's like done, I start it and it's done, right? Um, but if what, I, when I looked at your magic squares and you're saying that the, the cities have magic squares. Um, my affinity for it was so 
great that I have to wonder if it wasn't part of some other kind of schooling or training or whatever I received as a kid. And I love cities. Like I'm a city person. I am not moving out to the rural areas with, with y'all <laughs> when the, whatever happens, happens, right? I'm a city person. And like, you know, I'm actively um, engaging the mystery of, you know, movement between cities with, uh, you know, unusual travel means, right? And I'm curious as to one's awareness to sort of calculate or remember or whatever it is um, the numbers of particular cities for said type of travel. What are you showing us, Christopher? Your QR code? Oh yeah, he's muted. You're muted there, buddy. Uh, uh, there. FedEx. It, I, I have my computer on top of a package, and as you're talking about city blocks and all that, I always love that. Because the domes I uh, I build are mandalas that are popped up into three dimensions. So when I think of a block and like the way you described it, the city block, and that just popped up into three dimensions, there's just so much more information in it. You know, so if you were if you were a plasma being that was like actually, you know, of a higher consciousness, you would see the QR code in three dimension. You would see it more like a hieroglyph. The, uh, just showing off your nice new website here, man. Looking I didn't good. even know it was up. <laughs> What'd you say? That's beautiful. It's looking good, dude. When you were talking about the Tesla domes, right? These domes that happen. Um, I feel like I think that's happening in cities, but I think that like so here. Actually, I had this interesting with it this morning here in Austin. I think that there's an area of town that is like under one dome and then like it's not that i think that that's wild and open and free outside of that dome i think there's another bigger larger dome uh you know outside of it but i was outside running this morning earlier than i usually do so it was still dark when i started um and when i was looking at the buildings on the other side of the lake reflecting upside down perfectly in the water right i got to a certain point where like that wasn't happening anymore, right? On the, like, uh, like to the left of this line, nothing was reflecting in the water. And to the right of the line, everything was like perfect reflection, like, and whatnot. And to me, it, it like, it, it was exactly in line with this area that I had point, you know, talked about just a few weeks ago on a show is where I think like, whatever this is, whatever this bubble is, whether it's like a vibrational or a frequency bubble or some kind of plasma or whatever it is, like, it was the two different sides of it, right? And there seems to be much more sound and light and all kinds of stuff inside that layer of the bubble than there is sort of on the other side. And I was kind of doing that thing that you do when you're little where you're like, now I'm in California, now I'm in Nevada, California, Nevada, right? Like in the dome, out of the dome, in the dome, out of the dome. But it was like weird. It was like dark inside of it and a little lighter outside of it, totally reflective inside of it, not reflective at all on the outside. It was bizarre. Perfectly, perfectly where I thought the dome was. That's to me, that's so cool because, you know, one of the first tenets in ether physics is frequency is location. You know, so you just, you know, just that little shit phase shift in your mind, it's a different frequency and you're in a different location. You're actually having a different experience, even though proximally it's very, very close. Oh, let me unmute you there, Emily. Okay, go ahead. It was pretty wild. I took some great, I'm obsessed with taking pictures of the reflection of the city in the water. And I usually do it during the day, but I got a lot of pictures of like sort of in the dark this morning. And it literally looks like there's just absolutely a second Austin in the water. And it's so interesting. Like there's definite, there's things in the reflection that do not appear to be in the thing that we think of as the, the real world. Like I'm some starting to think that maybe we're confused and we're living in the reflective reality. <laughs> and there's one with much more definition than what I think of as the water or whatnot. And I've noticed this in the light before, but it was interesting to see it in the dark as well. And, and to be something when I've noticed it in the, during the daytime, it tends to be like in the sky or in the clouds. I notice that there's like some kind of structure in a cloud that I can't see in the sky, but I can see it in the reflection in the water. But when I was looking at some of the buildings upside down, 
there was literally like light artifacts, like lighting on a building that was not there in the one that is the, what I think is the real world, but was there in the upside down one. Like, where is that light coming from? Right. I, I kind of maneuvered around and took the picture from a couple of different angles and whatnot. And, you know, I, I I'm starting to become highly suspicious of which mermaids. <laughs> Merman. Totally. I'm still thinking about a comment from earlier in the chat from Jenny. She said that a lot of consumer electronics put off a B flat frequency. And uh, that's fascinating to me because that would be like, um, <laughs> like a weak crown chakra tone. That makes sense. Crown would be just like the, the B note. So odd that that's putting out crown chakra frequency, but in a flat, that's the, totally a tangent. The flat Corona note. Yeah, sort of. Hmm. Yeah. Putting out the whole purple signal, if you will. But I'm definitely thinking about a lot of things from this conversation so far. I've had so many mind melting ideas listening to you guys go on that I can't keep track of them all. But it is interesting, the idea of, that you're saying in terms of like reflections, because water is mim in Hebrew, mim like we have memory and, you know, these bodies that we're in, they wouldn't operate without water. And if you look at the old world architecture, if there was some sort of free energy ether grid going on, there was interconnection between all the cities and buildings in the city with like waterways water was the conduit possibly so it, i'm still like back at the beginning where i'm thinking about <laughs> all the extra electricity in costa rica being sent to spain under the water and that they're making the costa ricans put their water on the roads route their water to the roads i don't know what's up so speaking of, of routing water i had a fascinating like sometimes you know you have like a the thing that you're it's not quite a remote view because it's happening like on the border of sleep like you're laying down and you know you know that thing when you like lay down in the afternoon for a half an hour and you sort of fall out somewhere you're not really sleeping you know the awareness is too high it was sort of, i have some of my best sort of remote views during that time and somehow i was taken into a pyramid in I'm assuming it was Egypt, but it could have been somewhere else. Um, and it was like a rave, but it was a rave like at a different time. Uh, there was like incredible techno music and light show and visuals, but there was no, um, none of the stuff was plugged into anything. So it wasn't even like, okay, it's plugged into a generator, like at a, you know, renegade party or whatever. There was no plugs into anything. And there was like wild laser light show and visuals and whatever. And I was asking, like, where are the lights coming from? Where is the electricity coming from? Where is it coming? And they were showing me the, like, duct, the water, like, the there was, like, water running underneath the pyramid, right? And, like, literally this water was powering this stuff without there having to be any wiring or hooks or anything like that. It was the wildest. I mean, I've been to some pretty, um, pretty advanced technology electronic music events. Um, I used to go to the droid behavior interface parties and that was like the most wild display of like light and sound and technology you can imagine. And this was like completely like far beyond that. Right. Um, when I go to droid behavior parties, like there's just an endless table and stacks of all of these different kinds of machines for making sound and visuals and all this kind of stuff and wires going everywhere. And this was like, all very simple to set up whatever the music the DJs were doing in this vision and there was almost no very little machinery and they were just pointing me to like this water that was running underneath the pyramid was the water making light yes was, yeah that yeah, have you heard the term sonoluminescence yes sonoluminescence you know who i learned about sonoluminescence from who lord stephen christ do you know who lord stephen christ is no. Oh, wow. You know, those people that are just like, wow, this dude is fucking batshit. But like one or two things they said, I can never forget it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I like quite the like crazy two and a half, three day rabbit hole dive due to this guy that like, 
you know, I had fortunately at that time, like enough meth to fuel and I, you know, or <laughs> whatever, but the rabbit hole I went down, I still think was one of the most interesting I've ever experienced. And he used to talk about sonoluminescence and actually in his videos, the sort of colors he uses on the graphics when he describes it actually matches perfectly the, the tone of the colors of the lights that were in this vision. And this vision was, I think before I ever knew about Lord Stephen Christ, but, um, uh, it was, yeah, I think that the, the light was coming from the water and then that light was somehow powering all the other things, but I, it was, it was fascinating, whatever it was. I was like, can I come to the party, please? <laughs> right. so, so with light, so there's a, this is a really cool thread to go into because we're talking about the reflection, like you're seeing the cityscape, you know, vertically, and then it hits this horizon of water, the MIM. And now you're in memory, and now you're you have another vertical element going down, but it's split because the horizon's always split through your heart. At least the way I experience it, whenever you're you're seeing a plane of view and you're actually witnessing something, the horizon line always goes through my heart. Like I've I've written a, a bunch of essays about it. Like I call it the blue line horizon. I don't know if this happens for anybody else, but that's what it is for me. And I I lived in, grew up in Florida, so I was always on the water. And I always noticed, huh, every time I'm looking out over the ocean, the blue line of the horizon is going right through my heart. And so you have this, your your memory, your, your, you're seeing the reflection going down, and there's this extra light, you know, and it's in the water. There's some sonoluminescent quality coming from something in the water. And I bet you the quality of the water would have a lot to do with what quality of light you would be receiving. And I think that's one of the reasons like you, you brought up like the skyline when we first started this. And you said, you know, they were kind of whiting out the sky. I think a lot of that is now because the sky is so brilliant now, like the sonoluminescent luminaries are always signaling us and giving us this extra, this extra information. And I always notice that that information or the flicker rate or whatever you're going to call that is directly, at least when I'm witnessing it relative once again to where, where my heart is at, like where, where, where my horizon is. Where, where I'm giving my attention in that regard. So somehow, some way, it all kind of feels interrelated to me. Big time. You know, I'm uh, instantly drawn into the myth of Narcissus uh, staring at his own reflection. And whenever he tries to, uh, I researched that recently for a series we did on the, on mirrors and the esoteric history and significance of mirrors. And it turns out there's a lost ingredient to that myth that has fallen by the wayside. The collective does not like to give Narcissus the, his full aspect of the story. It turns out he had a twin sister in some stories that died, and he was seeing her in himself. It, that was part of his own fascination with his reflection, was he was seeking what he had lost. So you know, I think Narcissus gets a he gets a bad rep, uh, but somewhat rightfully so. Um, now, uh, one other, one other aspect <clears throat> that seldomly gets injected into the story is, as he's obsessing over his own reflection, he periodically will try to embrace himself or even kiss himself, and when he does, uh, his his dialogue is that his love will run away. Whenever he reaches out to embrace his affection, his, his uh, focus of his affection, it runs away. It dissipates because of the ripples, right? Well, this is strangely beautiful because in the background, in the woods, is a nymph called Echo. And Echo has been pursuing Narcissus for so long, and he's, and he's, too, he's too stuck on himself. He doesn't care about Echo but she has this strange neurotic curse that Hera put on her that she is doomed to only repeat the last half of whatever she hears. 
She cannot speak. She can only repeat the tail end of someone else's commentary. And so uh, the comedic play of the characters is that all of the words that Narcissus chooses to speak, the second half of that phrase is this strange reciprocation from his reflection. And it's actually Echo behind him who's saying the second half of his phrase. And so it becomes the perfect recipe for him to be drawn even more into himself because his own voice is speaking the tail end of the phrase. So he feels this reciprocal affection from his from his own. Uh, that, that's word. a concrescence. That goes back to your magic squares. Right. Yes. Uh, and also uh, sonoluminescence because an echo sound is in the air. It's concentric rings or circles. And so in a strange way, we have sonoluminescence uh, embodied in the story of Narcissus in a fun way. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. That these, I just love how old these old these stories are, but how high tech they are today. And, and we seem to be harnessing them on a very advanced uh, way. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. I have yeah. some mythology to throw into the mix too, actually, that I was thinking about. So uh, thinking about the whole idea of, I'm, I've just really been noodling the roads and the water and the electric power lines. And uh, the, so the word road, like R-O-A-D, it comes, uh, there's a lot of etymology I could dig into with that, but it is coming from a word that actually does pertain to the sea which would be R-H-O-D-E, or the Greek rhodos. And road, just road, in Greek mythology, is one of the daughters of Oceanus and uh, Tethys, who are titans of the ocean. So, <laughs> uh, oddly enough, the word rhodos in Greek could mean uh, a rose, actually. So there's that whole aspect of it it could mean uh it could potentially be coming from the in phoenician it's kind of written kind of hebrew style so the letters would transliterate as more like hrd <laughs> so that's hard but also it is road as well potentially and that was a word referring to serpents actually so the power lines under the ocean the rhodos the all roads lead to rome Rome Bro, is a word. We're thinking about Cecil Rhodes. We're talking about concrescence also. And you're talking about the circle within the circle within the circle. Yeah, exactly. And here's the other wild part. Rode, R-H-O-D-E, has three, well, two anagrams. One of them is Horde, Horde. <laughs> and the other one is Herod. Herod is the great, in the book of Revelation, Herod is the dragon. The red dragon. Herod is astrotheology. There wasn't a King Herod in reality. So when we're talking about Herod, you have the story of the king that wanted to execute all the infant males, but also you have the idea of uh the big Draco constellation that circles the pole star. So that the pole star Draco is the only constellation that goes through all 12 houses of the zodiac. And this R word road or rhodos is coming from a word referring to serpents and roads and oceans and we have this thing going across the oceans with internet and power lines and it's touching every continent touching yes. every house if you will like the draco constellation so i don't right. know that's where i'm at right now it's hoarding the gold that is the pole star that's really, yeah, there's so much in that. There's so much in that. It's hoarding the gold of the uh, of power, just electricity, right? It's the now Hoard. modulating the ether yeah. in the whole realm. He's HRD. He's hoarding the treasure, the gem. That's really fun. So I have one to throw at you guys based and on- hurting, hurting everybody, hurting and hoarding. Just want to throw that out there. Hurting everyone with the way internet <laughs> information hurts people to one pin or another. So um, with all these things we're talking about, I feel like I might be, we may be able to arrive in it an, and, and it, at an answer for something I've been perplexed about, this experience that I had several months back. 
right? So we were on the roof of the build. So I'm on the roof right now, like the top floor here, there's like a, a deck with like a pool, it's just out there. And then you can go look at downtown Austin from it, right? Like if we take a break, I could probably turn my computer and you could, could see the whole skyline of Austin down there, right? And um, we were sitting up there and the night was just so that like, I could see um, the night light, the night sort of the cityscape at night with the lights it looked like it was could be many many different things like from a certain angle you could see like it looked like the Giza plateau from another angle it looked like there was like it, if you you know how like when you are in San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge they have those like the wires that like there's like the that the segments of the bridge that are connected by the wires that like go up into sort of pointed arcs and whatever right it looked like Cesar Chavez Boulevard that is on the front street of downtown looked like the Golden Gate Bridge or like the Champs Elysees in France that was connecting all these time periods or whatever. It looks like a much more, it's already a magnificent city, Austin, but it looked like a much more magnificent city that was somehow connected to all other cities or whatever, right? And then I looked down into the water and I noticed this was the weirdest thing ever, right? So the light from one building on the other side of the lake was reflecting at one point right in the water. And then there's these sort of, um, there's this like a suspended walking bridge out over the lake on this side that has some areas that are like gathering areas that have these like metal installations on them that have some lights on it. And the way the two structures and the lights were reflecting in the water created like almost like a, a picture, like it was the, like a lot of definition in it. And I looked at it and it was the weirdest fucking thing. It looked like this place that I went to a party in Los Angeles years ago. It was like in this abandoned sort of building. And there was this hallway that was lit in an interesting way. And there's, you know, like that was where you sort of waited in line to get into the party. And then further down the hallway, there was like some other weird rooms and whatnot. But when I was looking into the water, it was like I was back in that hallway in that abandoned building at the party and I could see the people fucking in line. It was like it was the weirdest fucking thing. It was like, what is this? Like if I swim out into the water right now, will I be back in 2013 in Los Angeles at this party? Like and, and then it was a question like, well, should I take that chance? Like that would be fascinating. Right. And, and we can sit here and talk about it all the time. But like, you know, like what what, what like, <laughs> you know, we'll never know because I didn't do it. But it wasn't just like, I wasn't, I hadn't thought about that in for, like, forever. So it wasn't like I was front loaded with thinking about that. And then, you know, no, it was like, I was like transported back to that, right? It was bizarre. And I was showing people that were on the roof. I was like, look at that. And I was pointing out, I was like, do you see the hallway? Do you see people waiting in the hallway? Do you see that room over there? Do you see that door over there? And everyone was like, oh my fucking God, right? It literally looked like people were late, waiting in line to get into a party in a hallway in an abandoned building in the middle of the lake, right? And I, I have yeah. not, I, I've shared this with all my most imaginative friends from, from youngsters to elders and, and whatever. And everyone's just like, got nothing for you, but that's fantastic, right? <laughs> I would really like to see all of the water in your in your natal chart, in your conception chart, because the, the water is definitely playing playing with you. Because you like all these urban environments, but you're so connected to the water. The water is like your your vista into into you know a, an actual an actuality, you know. Yes, uh, a good amount of water in my chart, right? It's like 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 half, like almost half my chart or more is is like water, probably. That's awesome. So one thing uh, before I forget, I just want to mention Sudoku Twilight Speak for seduce you. So it's very interesting that you feel drawn into sud Sudokus. Yeah, Daniel on the Rockfin chat said, I was really addicted to Sudoku for about three years to the point it interfered with my life. Wow. wow. Well, <laughs> he yeah. said that, like Emily mentions, they started cropping up in my dreams all the time as well. So, so yes. Yeah, so the numbers seduce you. The difference, by the way, between a magic square and Sudoku, Sudoku is that Sudoku, you're matching columns and rows to make the same number and in a magic square you're also getting the diagonals and in some magic squares they're even set up so like if it's a 
six by six, you'll have all the different, you'll have like the three by threes inside the six by six also equal the same number. Uh, some magic squares are really crazy like that. That's what's fascinating what you said though, because one of the things that people were who were impressed with my Sudoku solving skills noticed is that I use a di diagonal method as my best quick solving. I don't just use the columns and the rows. I use a diagonal method and people are like, what the fuck are you doing? But that's how I do it so fast. So I'm wondering if there, if it's some prior knowledge in this life or another of something about magic squares that I'm using in a way to do the Sudoku that makes it seem like magic when I do it. Nice. But, uh, I just want to point out that my aunt, she is feminine. She has, you know, she has that allure. So the idea of dancing with my aunt is, it's it's very sedu seductive, <laughs> uh, but another thought that I wanted to put forward was that we in our weave on the mirrors. Chance, you were there for this for that for the mirror show, you know. Uh, so F's in old font were interchangeable with S's. They literally had the same exact shape, and they would just use the same uh, uh, print block for S's and F's. And L's and R's are interchangeable. So very easily, the word reflection becomes resurrection. And so I find that uh, just very profound that, you know, your, your memory is able to resurrect experiences from the past uh, when you see reflections. Can I ask you guys a question? Have you ever had a directional reversal, like a complete 180? So to give you an example, when I was a little kid, I I was on a school bus and then I always knew the school bus was going one direction. I dropped my matchbox car. I went down, picked up the matchbox car. And then when I got up, I was really confused because I was like, wait a minute, why aren't we going to school? And I asked the bus bus driver and she's like, What are you talking about? We're we're still we're still going. I'm like, no, we're going the opposite direction. Totally. I have had this, but I got to point out you're in a vehicle playing with the vehicle, right? There's a square. There's the magic square. There it is. There it oh, is. Shit. Yes. I, I, I had this as a child a couple times, uh, maybe a year apart. I think I was five or six. Both times were the same scenario. Uh, I was following a dog. Uh, in the first time I was, uh, it was, it was my dog whose name was dog. And <laughs> I was f following him out into the woods and we're along a Creek, a Creek path. Uh, and we're going away from the house and we were gone for the longest time ever. It was like my most, uh, bold adventure at that age. And somehow where the creek is always on my left-hand side the whole time. And somehow we only went the one direction and we came back to the house. And the creek was still on my side. I had to cross over the creek to get to the house. And I have no, I never turned around. We only went the one direction. I so got how, how does this deal with reflection? Because when we're looking at a reflection, we're seeing a reversal. So, so also like when you're looking at like you're looking at the 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 cityscape in the water, you know, it, there it's 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 opposite, but it's vertically opposite. So what's going on? <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. I have a couple of ideas. First of all, I want to ask you if your dog's name became God when the directional reversal. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, so, Speaking okay. of reversals, in ordinal gematria, God is 26 and noise is 62. Like a reversal nice. of each other. Nice. Okay. So I have had a variety of anomalous experiences uh, on the lake here, but two stand out as similar to each other and I think are related to what you're talking about here. Okay, so several months back, we were over on the far west side of the, the river or the lake in, in Zilker Park. And we were crossing this little footbridge that goes over the, like right kind of near Barton Springs. 
And um, I had been talking quite a bit about this area in terms of like thinking that there's some sort of like portal or temporal something funky there. And um, we're walking across the bridge and it was kind of a cold day and I was a little agitated. And this older gentleman comes up to me and like, like beelines right towards me and, and mumbling. Like I was having a hard time understanding him, but was making saying something about his the compass. He didn't have a compass, but he was like, if you go over there, the compass will be north south. And I was like, what? And he like he he said it again. And he's like, the compass, I think what Laura told me he was saying, because I was having trouble understanding him, my hearing isn't great. And then he was also mumbling. I think she, she, she said what he was trying to tell me is that where it's east west, the compass says north south. And he was pointing me over to where, right? And I just couldn't understand him. So I just kind of blew him off and I kept walking. And, and then we got a few feet further. And like, she's like, Emily, I think he was trying to tell you something related to what you've been talking about. And we went back and looked for him and I could not find him, right? I could not find him. We weren't, it wasn't very far or, or whatnot. So we went over into the area that he had been pointed into. And there was like a very strange little sort of, there's like a little kid's train that goes through this area. And there's like a, an edge, like of where it goes under a bridge. And there are these paintings there that make it look kind of like a portal. Of course, I don't have, I didn't have a compass with me or anything like that, but it became like the thumbnail for a show that um, Michael and I did called, you know, like way gates and the wheels of time. Right. But it was kind of interesting. And it reminded me a little bit of the little train in um, Griffith park and travel town in Los Angeles. Right. And it, it started me really thinking about some of these famous parks that have these little kids lands and trains in there. And like when I would, had been on the travel, the little train, the last time at Griffith park with my nephew a few years before, they had said all aboard going to Austin. And I was I remembered that in that moment. I was like, wow, that would be fascinating if there was some sort of ability to connect that way there. So that happened and he seemed to appear out of nowhere and disappear. And, you know, it was in on, on one end of the lake and, and in front of an area that I pegged is like a very anomalous spot. And then just last week we were on the other end, actually just over here, right over there on the other side of the lake, um, there's a, a power plant and a baseball field. And we were walking on this area that I call the sandbar. And this gentleman came running towards us from the other direction. He was moving pretty fast paced, right? And I noticed him, I'm like, wow, that guy's pretty fast, right? Like, and then all of a sudden, a few, a little, like a couple hundred yards down, he, he would mind you, he was going the other way. He was now in front of us and looking back at me and seeming confused and wanting our attention. And he starts telling us that he had, a, he, he fell in the water. He thinks he fell in the water, that he had a seizure and he's trying to figure out where he fell in the water. And, and he said, what happened? He said he, he'd had a car accident that caused him to have like a stroke or something many years before. And that when he has seizures as a result, sometimes there's like an amnesic period after the seizure for a little bit. And that he thought what had happened was that he had fallen in the water, had a seizure, fallen in the water, and then gotten up and started running again when he was still in the amnesic period. Because he, when he came to, he was running and then he realized he was soaking wet. He would not like, so we were like, do you need help? Like what's happening, right? Like he seemed intent on telling me everything about him, like going on and on and on. And talking about these seizures and, and, but he was worried about finding, he had his phone, he had everything he needed, but he really felt like he needed to find this spot where he fell in the water. And he stayed with us for probably 15 minutes. Right. And I went through a variety of feelings about the situation during that 15 minutes from like anxiety about this person in one way to like not anxiety. And then on a certain level, like, I don't want to say annoyance, but like I, I couldn't get quite what he wanted. And there was a few strange areas he kept seeming to be attracted to as like places where he thought he might have fallen in the water. And I was like, how would he have fallen in the water from the trail? Like it would have been hard for him to, to you know, they weren't areas where like the trail just is just a few feet from the water. It was like areas where he would have had to like had some big tumble, but all of them seemed to have like 
pathways up to the trail. Um, and at the end afterwards, like Laura and I talked about it the rest of the, the walk and then, you know, talked about it the next day and talked about it with Michael in the show and whatever. I think he came out of the water to a different Austin than the one he went into the water in. And I think he was confused because almost everything was the same, but not everything was the same. And he couldn't make sense of where he was. Like it was just, just enough different that the thing he uses as his marker as to like, I got onto the trail here or I parked there or whatever was not quite the same. It was almost the same, but not quite. And, um, I did look, he told me everything about himself, including who his brother was, who his, you know, doctor was and whatever. I went and I, I did look up the doctor. There is a real doctor with that name in Austin that it does do neuroimmunology and whatnot. But there was something that was like the bookend to the other thing that had happened on the other side of the lake. And each side of the lake has a power plant on it, right? You know, and and anomalous things going on in those areas. And so I think I met two people who are from whatever it is I'm looking at when I, when I see the upside down city in the lake and that, you know, you're not supposed to swim in this lake. They try and tell people there's like the kind of algae that's going to make you sick in there. But I think they don't want people going into the lake because they know what happens. There's mermen. <laughs> <laughs> or mermem water Mer memory. Mermaid. So uh, I, I sent it over to the Vibrant Telegram chat, but uh, a while back we were, I think this is actually from, um, I know Marty Leeds does this, but I think it was Michael who brought this up in his early research is how uh, one of, I think it's Septenary Gamatria. Which Michael? That, uh, Michael Wan. Oh, okay. Yeah, that the word river is all fives, all across the board. It's five fives. And so it, which completely codes water. You know, yes. five five is the the carrying harmonic. At least I'm I'm doing all this this study now for I'm giving this whole presentation on water and and Whenever you have a pentagram or a pentagon with the phi ratio, it completely encodes water. So that's incredible. Phi v. Right. <laughs> Which is phi v when v is a five. <laughs> it's like. Oh, man. And just, yeah, and v. Square again, it's the it's just banging. So what what's the magical square of five concressing five? Uh, it would be uh, Mars. So how and Mars how rules the work? what? Mars rules the mare. The mare. Ah. Yes. Gente. Yes. Uh, I'm I'm a, a I'm really into electric universe cosmology, and one of my very hard to prove beliefs is that the uh, water that we were once upon a time in an axial alignment, Saturn on top, Mars in the middle, Earth on the bottom, and that Saturn bled uh, the salt water down in, uh, in, this, uh, in a deluge and stripped Mars of all of its, uh, in its entire uh, atmosphere and brought it down here to Earth. So the ocean is in fact the stripped away atmosphere and whatever of Mars. And that's how that, uh, that term uh, holds an ancient truth. Is that why Mars is so pissed? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mars is not always called Mars, you know. Tire. Uh -huh. Mars is also Ram or Rama. No. Right. Yeah, what's what's Mar backwards? It's Ram. You guys do all this stuff, and you're going backwards and forwards and upwards and downwards and stuff, and I, I always am coming into it, like, half-cocked. Because I'm like, <laughs> where, where are you even start? Like, what is the point that you're trying to get to? Like, wh when you start to make every word mean every other word, then you're not, like, I'm not seeing what the 
what the through line is. Like in certain things, I see the through line, but like, I, I, I need to understand like with, with deciphering and going from whatever the etymology of something is and moving all the way through to where we're at now, what is the significator? What is it that, that you're trying to say about it? Well, one, one thing is that the, the psi, PSI, the psychology, which is shaped like a trident <laughs> in Greek, uh, the, psychologically, we do hear these things on a subconscious level, underneath the ocean and uh, un below the surface level. We all hear this and we are all taking in all of this information. But when we bring it forward and reflect it into the conversation, we're just highlighting the fact that it was always there, you know, uh, in, in, so there are, you know, there are, uh, you could say there's palindromes is when it goes back and forth. And those are the most obvious. Those are, uh, more surface level and more and more objectively true. But then there's palind or then there's anagrams where you scramble the letters right. and it comes out. And uh, in sometimes the uh, anagrams can be incredibly revealing. And you can get six, seven, eight words, but six of those words don't really fit this relationship that you're seeing, you know? Uh, can I talk? Can I give you my like full lock me up in the uh, crazy institution yeah, uh, yeah, let thoughts? Me, let oh, me you just give, you got more. Okay. Yeah. Let me drop one more or good, a good example of an anagram that I've, just recently found is the that oculus you know the oculus is the head gear set that all the kids are playing in the you know augmented reality they're playing games with this head gear set that they see into a whatever their video game uh full immersion well the word oculus can be anagrammed out uh to spell c u soul and we know that the wind, the eyes are the window to the soul. And I have played that game uh, and I've seen some creepy shit in those parallel realities that freaked me out. I don't ever want to play again, especially when I found the anagram in the name of the game. Yeah, in the in James True's novel about like the AI demiurge, basically, <laughs> uh, for, for some reason, forgetting the name of the novel, but there's a. Uh, like multiple components to this AI God that gets built. And one of the components is a database connecting all information that humanity has, but just indexed and searchable, not really uh, AI itself. And then there's another one that has like a simulation of a body for itself digitally. And they're like tried to map all the different feelings that they wanted the AI to be able to feel to stimulus in this digital body <laughs> so it was like feeling with a body sort of and then there was a third component which was this sort of black mirror scrying ai that could just look at the micro expressions and temperature changes and full electromagnetic spectrum scan of a human being and pull information out of them in almost instantaneously like know what they're going to say before they could, they would say it and know their life story and anyway those components made like this ai super god that's a fiction that wasn't even the point i wanted to get into but sort of is <laughs> okay so the all the different ciphers and all the different ways to pull information out of scripture or out of language we don't even use a fraction of them when we're talking about them like in marty's book lord jesus christ is a chapter about just some of these and the ancient priest class or the mystery school, the Masons, whatever version of it you want to talk about, they were studying language and studying scripture through so many different lenses. They had like take every letter and reduce it by one letter, like shift it one over in the alphabet and read the verse that way or one forward, read the verse that way. You know, A is one, Z is 26, Z is... 20 or Z is one, A is 26, like going back backwards and forwards in every direction. And 
I could go get that chapter and just read through a bunch of the different types of ciphers that are possible. And that would just be a fraction of them. So it's not, okay, things are coded on purpose with ciphers like that. But I think what's going on is that these, these worshipers or studiers of the logos were using all these different methods to try to communicate with what they were calling God or what they thought the logos was and that meaning would just emerge out of these things. Whenever you apply different lenses of looking at it, more and more meaning would emerge out of it. I wonder lately, this is the lock me up. This is crazy <laughs> thing, but I wonder lately if the astral realm as we experience it, which I don't consider to be from my own experience, the same as like, the lower world in shamanic journey work, which is sort of like an earth consciousness plane or the psyche of the earth or your inner world, like where you maybe go in dreams and your own psychic uh, bubble space. I don't think the astral space is the same as that. And I wonder if the astral was the first artificial overlay put onto the reality and that maybe it came about coinciding with the creation of language or not that far from it. And that when we started working with language, this new being or new body or layer of existence on the fractalized one universal life that everything, every being is a micro of <laughs> that this new astral layer is like the logos being or the demiurge being, or the, the God that people interact with that is sort of like the high father you know, Mercury, Thoth, Odin character. And I wonder if what's being built right now, the metaverse thing, and this new new version of technology to create another layer of space is like kind of like Steiner's eighth sphere idea, that there really is a new layer being tacked on to the, the cosmic body, the cosmo, whatever you want to call it. And I wonder too if we I wonder too if we're interacting with um that lo that being that I'm describing as something that maybe was an actual living man at one point and found sort of through like the Egyptians believed that if the the Rin, which was the name, was continued to be spoken into the future, then the being would still exist on this realm. In some way, in some capacity, it could be accessed, communicated with, talked to. So whenever we find all these syncretisms that show us that like, okay, this is all of these beings are actually sort of congruent with the same one being. And maybe that's like the point of it. Maybe <laughs> this astral logos, <laughs> not astro, not astro, not astro, astrology, sorry, but this astral logos, or maybe there's a connection between the two. You know, astro I don't know. Maybe there is a, maybe there is a different, yeah, astro theology. Maybe astral theology is what we're doing here, which is sort of making a god out of uh, a metaverse, an artificial realm, because technically all of its existence, whatever this being is, in the Ren being spoken and in the names that we're continually repeating and talking about forever and ever at infinitum, we're talking about fiction. <laughs> you know, we're talking about fictional mythologies and scriptures that are all allegory. And they, they have many layers of meaning, meaning about nature, meaning about morality, meaning about all kinds of stuff. But in the sky clock too, a sky clock is Kronos. You know, is this, is when we look up at the st the stars in the skies are, and we're starting to wake up to the fact that like space is not as it is described. Is that the projection of the astral? You know, is that us seeing Kronos, which is one of the names for this one being, uh, <laughs> doing its time keeping thing, you know, the setting the pace for all of us, creating that velocity of trade and uh, evolution to build the next layer of its body, which is like the physical machinery of the realm. I don't know. This is all really far out. I was kind of just rambling. You know, I think the last time we were on the Vibrant together, I brought up the show American Gods. And the whole thing, I love the interaction. Like they have all these, you know, gods that come together on Easter. 
on Astara's day and Jesus is there, but there's like 47 different Jesuses. And he, he's interacting with the one Jesus that's sitting on the water. And he's like, yeah, you know, I've had a hard time believing in you. And Jesus is sitting there on the water. He goes, I am belief. And I just love that. Like, cause oh. that, that was like so mind blowing to think of that. Cause I love that show's whole concept around these, these astral, you would say astral beings keep rebranding themselves <laughs> to, to continually get the egregoric attention that's needed from the population to serve, to survive. I love Yeah. That. I mean, think about he, he's belief, belief. Well, a bud is Buddha <laughs> belief and a bud, you know, belief in a bud. He's your buddy. Yes. Uh, uh, recently, I heard somebody uh, do a breakdown on the Kabbalah of the of the first word of the Torah, the Barashit, and they pointed out that you can take each letter, and uh, in Hebrew, all the letters have meanings, and you can take them, and you can uh, they become the building blocks for a whole other level of meaning that they can rearrange into whole other sentences. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing is, I think, is uh, has a lot of that Kabbalistic uh, potentiality, you know, uh, breaking down things to their fundamental, rearranging, and then uh, finding what else can be gleaned from, the, from what's provided. One, another example, I don't know what this is called. If anybody knows, let, let me know. But uh, you know how? from uh, the movie 2010. I mean, a lot of people have heard this by now, but H-A-L, you take those letters in the alphabet, in the order, order is a very important word, by the way. You, uh, you take them in their order and you move them over one letter and it becomes IBM. And, and that's yet another form of encoding something right out in plain sight by using the standards of the order of the alphabet to convey something to somebody else who might be able to decipher it. Dave, what are you doing, Dave? Dave. <laughs> and the last thing too, you know, the idea of something, something from the realm of fiction materializing into the, the actual reality. Well, isn't that what we're doing when we interact with, ether or the potent the field of unpotentiated expression of you know reality and then bringing it into reality <laughs> there's nothing that crazy about it i wouldn't be sitting in this chair unless somebody had the idea in their imagination and then built the chair into the realm of form so it's not that it's not as crazy as it seems maybe one more thing to give this to emily i used to live next to ibm up in colorado up in um Boulder. I live by uh, a huge center hub of IBM and they had, uh, it was its own little mystery. They were uh, embedded into the hillside of many, many burial mounds. And people do not even realize that they're burial mounds. They'll drive right past them. They're kind of off the beaten path, but they're just rows and rows of burial mounds and what that means and the implications of that and its relationship to IBM uh, on the 40th parallel all ties into Michael Wan and Ross Ben's work in a major way. But uh, one other factor here is they had a whole shipyard of semi trucks uh, on their facility grounds. But I would I live so close. I drive by there every day. You don't see semi trucks coming or going on the facility. They're coming and going underground. They have to. They absolutely have to, or else they would back up this very uh, crucial. Uh, so good. Yes, this crucial location for traffic. If they had those trucks coming and going on whatever level, they had access to military underground networks uh, for sure. But I just got to tell you, Emily. Uh, that is the call. That's right next to the Colorado River that feeds right down to the network LA. of information hotbed that you live in right there in Austin. It feeds right down. And they used to tell us that we are we can't retain our own rainwater 
because the rainwater is already sold to Texas. I want to address what you just said real fast, and then I, I want to ask Toe for something. So wh when you said IBM was on burial grounds, my immediate thought was like, that was how they data mined before they data mined the way they do now, right? Um, so like that was the immediate thought. And then yes, about all those, like, I mean, the, the endless amounts of technology companies that are in like very weird off the beaten path locations where like it, it really complicated you'd think to get all the things they need and do all the things they need to do there unless they're actually doing something totally different than what they say they're doing. And, you know, I have a variety of thoughts about those things. Right. Um, but the, when you're talking about the water coming down um, from Colorado, right. The uh, I think that that's a lot of what, um, the Goro Adachi's Time Rivers idea is. I have the book, but I have not read it. And I know it, Michael's work is informed a lot by that. But from what I can understand is that like rivers are connected, like rivers and time are connected, I think through that idea of sort of like information stored in the mineral realm or in, 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 in you know, metals or minerals or whatever in water that then moves across all of these, you know, land or like, you know, the, the, the bed of the, the river or whatnot, like here we have a lot of limestone, right? So you're having this interaction of information from one location with information from another location. And it's moving over all of these different places and literally like moving time across space. Right. Um, so, yeah, um, I want to ask you, um, Christopher, did, did the question that you asked about what they're doing when they say this is that and this word is that and right, breaking, doing all this stuff with the words and whatever, it, like when you ask them, like, what, what, what is the point of that? Do you, did you, did that question get answered for you? It did in a way. I think my that was my current was, answer for right now. But the, okay. ask me another time. I'll say some my other problem, shit. My problem with these guys is they're prolific. They literally put out like ten hours of stuff every week, and so I jump into it, and I'm like, they're already, you know, three quarters of a way through a thought, and then they're all riffing on each other. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm not that symbolically literate yet. So I'm just like, okay, this is this, and this is this, and this is this, and this is this. But what the fuck is the point? Right, right. Like, okay, I get it. Everything has these multiple meetings. But if we're looking at a piece of media, or if we're looking at any type of creation, what are what is the creator of this creation implying with this with this um whether whether or not it's a subconscious language or whether or not it's the astral plane working through the person what is the literal messaging because you cannot tell me like i've i've listened to four of your shows on the moon night stuff it blows my mind. And I don't know what the fuck you guys are trying to tell me that Moon Knight is trying to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I think that that's why my theory about the uh, mystery schools and secret societies maybe being originally or maybe still some of somewhat to this day, but maybe originally being more like what we do when we sit around and decode something like Moon Knight, that that's what that those gatherings were for. and that the level of meaning coming through stuff like media in today's age. I mean, look at what is, who is media by the way, in mythology. Uh, I think that there's clearly more coming through that than human beings could intentionally weave in. And there's a lot of answers to your question, but ultimately when it comes to symbolism and syncretism, it is about finding a language that is beyond beyond human language like something more universal or primary or promethean if you will 
that the other, like looking for the ocean of language that all of our languages are like rivers off of or rivers flowing back into, or maybe kind of both. And part of the reason for that is because if we can get past the whole, like taking things literally and that my culture's version of history or my culture's version of spirituality is the right one and theirs is the wrong one. But when I can show you that they're, they're symbolically the same tradition in every way, <laughs> doesn't devalue the nuance that is different from culture to culture or the aesthetics or packaging, but it does demonstrate that even though we are all unique, our, our similarity outweighs our difference by humongous orders of magnitude. You know, and I, I agree with that. I just, for me, and I'm glad that there's some clarification. In this, there's no way in the world, there is no freaking way that the creators of Moon Knight have gone and created like you guys have literally dissected every freaking scene. Like the, the amount That's of what I'm saying. Saying. it's not no human beings wouldn't be able to put that much into it. We're no, we turned no a, a TV show that's like five hours in length, maybe maybe five and a half hours. And we've turned that into like 20 or 25 hours of analysis. Exactly. So I'm just like, I'm like, okay, this is obviously the angles, the angels, you know, Steiner's, you know, we're angels yes. work, working through these people, but like I'm right, and we're trying to call them up and be like, "What do you, what do you got for us? We're watching." You know, <laughs> I think that that's what's up, or maybe even just sort of in a all this self understanding of the fractal that every moment and everything you experience, if you pay close enough attention, then whatever it is energizes and enlivens, and like you know, like Emily was saying, be on one side of the street and everything's dull and then the other side of the street and you look back over where you just were even and it's all shiny and bright it's like perspective matters frequency is location yeah. uh, water seems to connect things just like memory is in a web of interconnected links makes me think of how like deserts <laughs> in the realm are so vast and humongous and there's no water there and like, you know, the distance or separation between one place to another is way bigger and it's drier. I don't know. But there's, as for the, yeah, as for your question, I think we can find meaning from just, we can treat everything like dream interpretation. You can treat everything like reading tarot cards. The The message is in every medium. Yes. So what's what's the relation to artifice relative to third chakra? So I notice in my life, you know, like how I understand the chakra system and how energy moves through my body, I naturally feel love after creation. So as, as the way I understand that is like there's there's something with the artifice there's something with art there's something with creation that's relative to third chakra and then there's some it's like a gateway like the way i feel it like earlier i was talking about the horizon and like whenever you view the horizon that i always feel that through my fourth chakra my heart chakra so there's something there's something here that the angels or the the astral plane uses through third chakra through solar plexus through artifice through creation that i'm i'm speaking for myself opens into into the heart do you guys have any insight into that i'll just explain a little bit that like more the sacral and second chakra is about the actual act of creating the thing back to the waterness of it all the flow state where you just get into putting things together and taking each step or every brush stroke flow state itself is really in sacral chakra sacral is linked up to third eye so the uh ability to perceive what it is in the realm of ideal and bring it into form is working between those chakras but having that center mm -hmm. active and that flow active makes you powerful 
because you're able to achieve things and accomplish things in the realm. And so that's the bridge, the next level of the rainbow bridge, if you will, going up to solar plexus, which really more governs power in general, P power and uh, purity in some respects, like energy itself and purity. If you look at the organs that are in the solar plexus region, it's a lot of things that have to do with like giving you energy, kidneys, adrenals, but then also things that clean and purify the blood and body systems. So I think that that's the relationship, how I understand it is that you need, you know, you have your root, you have your base, right? And it's generating the one, the heat, it's number one, that original heat. And that fire then rises up into the next chamber, if you will. And if it has flow, the in the sense of like it can continue rising, continue flowing, the, there's a channel for the energy. And that is uh, represented in the fact that you're like able to do things in a flow state or create things, build things, do work. Uh, you know, root is like rooted. You're, you're here. You've, you're here. You're planted. You've got the energy. You're holding it and you're building it. And then the next level up is flow. And then if you have flow, flow is power. And that gives you to the third. And then, you know, it goes up from there. We won't have to do a lesson on all the chakras, but that's kind of how I understand the relationship between those two. And then, then if you have power uh, going up into the heart, <laughs> the heart, there's a, <laughs> the next thing you want to do is preserve the power in some way, preserve the record of what you did, preserve the energy and the heart is like a recorder. It is always listening and hearing. So I, I think why here is in the word heart or ear is in right in the middle. The heart is like your third ear. The Egyptians called it the ib, which meant like recorder or scribe. So interesting phonetically too with, with the rivers of it all is that uh, a river is in Ari in Hebrew, which is also a word for lion. And the lion is the astro logos symbol relating pertaining to the heart mm -hmm. mm. yeah and, uh, leo is oil backwards and we burn oil for power but anyway so okay so there i want to go back to a, a couple of things so when you were talking about when when someone says this is also this is also that right and and and, and you know what are you trying to tell me like this is something that i've been um like thinking about quite a bit lately, right? Like I love wordplay. I always have loved it since I was a kid. My dad did wordplay with me. I've always been good at crossword puzzles, word searches. I liked to, you know, turn words inside out and upside down. I like any kind of puzzle and I like anagrams and I like, you know, rearranging all of that stuff. And then at a certain time I began to like gematria and all of that kind of stuff. And sometimes those things are useful if like when you change it around and decode something, then it you solve a puzzle. But sometimes I feel like we're just saying this is this is this is this. And it made me think of what you were telling me about. We were talking about the other day when you were talking about um, uh, monism versus theism and how like when the people like there's no differentiation and every like, you know, God, oh, God is everything. If everything is everything else. Right. Then like to me, I, I'm not sure I completely understand that. Right. Like a lot of people will, um, you know, I've done some studies into some of these, these things. Um, I used to think that like, you know, many, many years ago, I, Oh, that's something people are talking about that I don't understand. They must know more than me. They must be smarter. And so I read all their things and listened to all their videos and, and whatever, and I still mostly don't know what they're talking about, or if I do have some understanding, like to what end. And I've experienced a lot of people trying to communicate with me that way. Like they'll comment on something I said, or some show that I did, or some idea I had, and they'll do all this crazy language breaking down of it that seems like a lot of work and very interesting, but what I, when I ask them, what are you trying to tell me? No one can ever answer the question, whether it's with gematria or breaking down the blank words and telling me what it means in 37 different arcane languages and whatever. And other people will, you know, have 
see, seem to have some like knowledge of ancient esoterics or ancient occult secrets or or Freemasonry kinds of things. And they'll send me some huge big thing that I need to understand before they can explain the next thing to me. And like, I'm reasonably intelligent, I think. And it's like, why don't you just tell me what you're trying to tell me in words that I can understand, right? And it, I'm almost to the point where if people cannot explain to me in plain English, and by that, I mean the one that we all grew up speaking, and I understand that our language has been intentionally confused and all of that kind of stuff, right? But we do a lot of communicating and we explain a lot of complex ideas to each other. And this idea that there's just like some small group of things that exist outside of that, that we can't explain to each other in any way in the language that we use. And we have to do all this other weird stuff in order to understand it. But nobody ever does because we're all still here together, apparently still trying to solve the same puzzle, right? Like, so I asked myself the same question that you said when you asked them when they do that, like, what, what is the point? I've gotten to the place where it's like, you know, if somebody can't explain it to me in plain English, I think that if there's a complex idea, or I understand what you said when you were talking about how some of the rearrangements like opens things up and you can see it from a different perspective. So explain it to me in a language that I can understand. So I understand the concept and then say, now see what happens when I do it like this and how all of a sudden in a snap, I can understand quickly the same thing that it just took you five minutes or 10 minutes or three hours to explain to me, right? Kind of like when I saw that stuff in the water, if I had just said to the people around me, there's a rave in the water, they would have thought I was fucking nuts. So they did, you know, right? But I showed them each little piece and explained to them the story about what I was talking about and how, how I was seeing that. And then they were like, oh my God, I see it now, right? But I had to explain it to them in taking little parts and say, see that over there, that angle, the way it's doing that, this is causing this, this is causing that. And I think that a lot of this stuff, though it's very interesting and it's things that I've been interested in and, and continue to be interested in and, and, and whatnot, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, shouldn't do this to any extent, but we've all been very busy doing that, right? And like, I don't know if we're, are we, is there a puzzle we're trying to solve? Is there a question we're trying to answer? Like, I'm not, sometimes I'm not sure, right? Like I say if, yes. Okay. <laughs> There's a, if there's a if, the, if there's a puzzle we're trying to solve or a question an answer we're, or a question we're trying to answer, what is it and how is that stuff helping us get there? And I'm not saying that it's not. It's entirely possible that like it's escaped me and and and, and I've missed it or something. But there's a part of me that feels like it's a really good like exercise to keep us super busy for a long time. You know, getting smart about a lot of stuff. Um, but I don't know how much farther along we are in like understanding certain things. And I don't actually think that that's a lot of what the secret societies were doing. I think that they wrap themselves in that and they let people think that, that and sure there's some little ciphers and codes that they have. I think they're generally pretty simple. And once, once you know what they are, you know, then you also understand how they would work in a range and you can figure that part out. Um, I think that they were, you know, I think it's a pretty simple set of things that they're doing, right? They may be mystical and magical, but I think all of the pomp and circumstance is like the, the show and the window dressing and the distraction. And, and, you know, we're spending a lot of time being intra, you know, like really interested in it. Um, but I don't think the secrets are that complex. All right, let me lay it all out. I think I can do this in very plain English as to the why, what it, what I am in it for in terms of the stuff I attempt to talk about and explain, <laughs> because this needs reiterating a lot, I think. And I, I'm the type of person I don't like to re, I don't like to backtrack and say things I've said before in the same way. And the thing is, even when I do go back to revisit a subject, I'm still not going to say it the same way. So I need to let go of that and just talk about what matters and what's important. So what is important about syncretism? What is the goal? What is the uh, purpose of like, for me anyway? And I could probably speak for my friend Dylan on this as well. Okay, there is a system in this reality. It seems to have existed for as long as we can remember, as long as humans are aware, as long as we've had history. This is a system of mediators or intermediaries between us and what's good. What's good is also God. What's good is also the abundance of nature. 
So this parasitic class of middle management, priests, uh, lawyers, politicians, whoever they might, whatever role they might be playing, the whole time their role has been to get between us and the energy source in nature while siphoning from both sides. Yeah. Siphoning the energy from nature that we're pulling that naturally connected to and siphoning the energy b- back from us that should be going into nature and being a part of the tapestry of nature's balance. So these intermediaries, these middle managers, parasites have created a system of spiritual slavery to match the secular slavery. And the, this system is about a salvator, a salvation, a messiah, an external savior. I call it the messiop. The messiop is repeat, repeated throughout the fractal on every level. Wherever you go, people are outsourcing whatever version of whatever help that they could be giving themselves to an external. And that isn't always bad or wrong. In community and in tribe, that works great because we're all so interconnected and vibrationally mixed up together and our DNA is even starting to resemble each other and all of that, (laughs) that, you know, you know, you're not really, it's not like an extortion racket at that point. You know, the deal you give to your best friend or to your uncle is not the same as the, the deal you try to get out of some, some sucker. Not that I'm saying that people in our group are that way, but my point being this parasitic mediatory system is also in the spirituality and the exact same story is in the, all of the different spiritual traditions and to abrogate the mediator <laughs> to abrogate the vampire system we have to see how it runs across the entire fractal we have to see it for what it is and that means we need to syncretize all aspects of it from the legal system to the language to the mythology to you know, pharma, whatever you want, whatever part you want to look at. That is, I think, if I had to explain it in the simplest English I could, what I'm about. But then why there are so many details that might take a long time to explain and to lay them all out is because I, I can't see it. I can't not see it. I feel like I have the codes to the matrix and I can see phonetically how the, the same theme is playing over and over again. The same phonetics, meaning the same words, meaning the same characters meaning the same messiah over and over again. So I just like harp on whatever part of the pattern, the potter, the father I'm seeing at any one point. And I go in on that and it might get a little complicated or seem out in the weeds or seem unimportant or unrelated to other things. But like, I'm always doing that to try to fill in other people's data bank with enough detail that they finally kind of click and they're like, Oh, I see the blonde and the brunette in the numbers too, <laughs> like, you know, tank the matrix operator. Now the language is, now I'm seeing another dimension of the language. I'm seeing the hyper sigil in the logos or whatever, because it's, it's there, <laughs> it's yeah. there. And I had a spontaneous, I had a spontaneous experience once that lasted over a day where I got dropped into it full blast. And ever since then, the code has been revealing itself to me through external teachers or other sources or internal realizations. And it's accelerating now and getting more and more to where the code is revealing itself to me almost only through internal obs- internal revelation of my own observation. Okay. So all the things that you just said there, like I'm totally like, that's, I feel the same. Like that's, I totally agree. So it sounds like I'm glad you asked that because I do want to make sure that that's clear that that's why (laughs) we get into what we get into. So that what you just said was very clear, and it sounds like to me then, and tell me if I'm incorrect in this, then then correct me. That when you're doing that, that's you just externalizing like how you're working through the patterns, right? Like you're sort of like I have my own way of doing it, and I think I just don't necessarily like I have a different technique or different things and whatnot but you're sort of externalizing, you're working through that, you're noticing all the things and you're just kind of verbalizing it as, as you work through it um, and, and that's your way. And what you were just saying about the internal, like the internalizations, I think for me, 
Um, maybe just because of the environment that I was in or the people that I was with or not with, because I was isolated on my own a lot as I was doing a lot of this stuff with myself, I didn't verbalize them. I didn't say it. I just thought the thought inside or I just made my observation or when I was making my observation, I just chose like a, a different way to sort of like either verbalize it or express it or if I felt like I wanted to explain it. So is that right that you're just kind of like giving word to the the sort of um, making sense of the patterns and the ideas that you're seeing as you see them? That's a good way of putting it. And also with that, once we start to see the pattern more, the deeper meaning of the pattern will reveal itself, which is the the inner outer fractal reflection of how the the value the value in the mythology the value in the what's the value of language i mean not outside of like telling stories that are fictional the value of language is to describe reality accurately and transmit that observation from one being to another correct right, right. and so what's the value of fiction the value of fiction is other than what people are currently involved in it for which is entertainment <laughs> taming the mind the value of fiction is to with allegory transmit information that is true about reality from one mind to another so allegory is like another layer or level of language it's another dimension of language the first dimension of language is bring me that rock <laughs> that's what immediate uh, practical the next layer is telling a story uh, that gives somebody a moral lesson like you know <laughs> jimmy didn't go to bed on time and then the boogeyman ate him <laughs> the moral lesson is go to bed on time if you want to be healthy or whatever and then eventually like that balloons out to allegory that is so vast that it is describing the larger cycles of nature the sky clock the seasons whatever and so i think why the the class the, the parasitic or mediator class got the power they got was because somebody needed to hold on to the stories that people were used needed to use to remember forever exactly when to plant and when to harvest and when you know and when other parts of the cycle might be happening but then that creates a power differential because some people have that knowledge and some don't and over time we lose track of that po point of the knowledge which was that the allegory was useful because it was describing nature and so that's also why you know <laughs> there's only one nature <laughs> there's only one cycle of seasons there's only one way that a body grows there's only one way that you know nature is sort of flowing like that like a river and it, it's that's how that is so to me again it's bringing the it's actually bringing the value back to mythology if you will or scriptures to point towards what it's referring to about nature and some of that can go into the level of mathematics because the, there is like a sacred mathematics that comes through the language as well and comes to the scripture as well showing you like transcendental concepts that are themselves fascinating like pi and phi and stuff like that yeah it sounds like a lot like what jeremy narby describes as the twisted language language that the ayahuascaros and the shamans um, use and in that in their language like they like basket and cheetah is the same thing not because a cheetah is literally a basket but because in their visionary space like whenever there's a bath there's something like that's this basket shape then there's always at some other part of the vision the cheetah so you it, like the 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 basket indicates cheetah right and that's the way they talk about it when they're describing it when they're talking to other people who know what they know they'll just say basket and those people will know they mean cheetah right so you won't have to say basket is cheetah but he calls it a twisted language language and it is that it's like that that one implies the other is you know there's a whole series of connections there so on some levels that makes sense to me, but I also think that like sometimes, would you guys not agree with me though, that there's like a lot of people like sometimes who do this, that, that it's almost, sometimes it feels um, like a passive aggressive way of communicating. Like someone is telling me I have, they have something very important to tell me, but then they can't explain it to me in a way 
that I can understand. And sometimes I'm left thinking that I don't even think they understand what they're actually saying, which is yeah. nothing wrong with that, right? Like it's part of like all of us who are into decoding and trying to sort things out. Like there's times when something is so clear to us, but we cannot explain it to someone else. And when we start to try, we realize I haven't really worked all the way through this. I don't actually know what I'm talking about. But that exercise of trying to explain it and having to be able to make it clear to someone else actually sharpens you and makes you understand your own point better. When you get to the point that you can explain it clearly to someone so that they can understand and walking away with some level of meaning, even if it's not the full complete understanding, you have then arrived at a spot where you actually know what you're talking about. When you just think you know. Yes. <laughs> I think if somebody communicates something to you and they, you totally can't grasp it, then what they're communicating is more of a rep, unless you're just not paying attention, then the thing they're communicating that seems unteachable is probably just a memorization of a word salad that they listened to enough times till they could act like they knew. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the other thing too, to add in uh, is that a lot of people that do the syncretism, try their hand at it or try their hand in etymology that then leads them to like assume X equals five or whatever. Uh, really good rule of thumb is to play the three strikes game to before you decide something is definitely a match. And that game, you should play the three strikes game with languages that have similar meanings in phonetics or specific words between languages. That could be one strike. Uh, ancient artwork, ancient paintings, ancient definitely architecture or sculpture, something that is verifiably hella old and still exists and you can look at it. If that depicts the thing or the symbol that is also giving you a match to the, the language strike, then you got two strikes. And then the third strike, you know, maybe another source of one of those two things, but that if your strikes are all coming from books or from uh -huh. history, uh -huh. Yes. All forgeable. All could be said like this is by this person from this age. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. But if you have real world artifacts or it's an artifact in the language, then I think that the artifacts in the language are they count because language is so complex. <laughs> Those things just slip through the net <laughs> and they also kind of emerge naturally, especially if there's a universality to where language came from in the first place, like a Tower of Babel moment, potentially. I think we should move our way to a, a wrap up, though. I know that this is just yeah. getting. I, I, want like, take, I want to take a swing at that question and try to do it quickly and concisely if I can. Don't have to be too quick, but All I just right. want to make everyone aware that we're going to try to get our closing thoughts out for now. Nice. So, yeah, one thing that I like about what we do is it, it encapsulates a lot of truth and experience. Uh, personal truth and experience puts it in a uh, very easy, relatable uh, uh, package that I can pass on to somebody and they can exchange to somebody else. Uh, and, and that second hermetic principle is correspondence. So if we put these phrases and these ideas out, then somebody else can pick them up and hand them to somebody else and it'll spark a whole uh, new perspective for them. Uh, to broaden their horizons. And a, one good example is like, I've heard a thousand people take a thousand swings at the word officer. And it's one of my favorite ones to like break down. And recently, and I've looked at it from all the angles I've ever heard. And I just recently, I found a whole nother angle to come at it. Uh, but officer, I once discovered, uh, has a biblical translation to the eunuch of the Pharaoh. And when you hear that, because we don't have that cultural context anymore, but you go and you look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, the cops, they've got their phallic implement that they're always looking to beat somebody else up with their phallic implement, you know? So eunuch of the Pharaoh was a really rewarding uh, beans. Nice. Nice. was a nice uh, way to speak power to, or truth to power. You know, that these people presume to have power over, like chance was saying, to be a mediator, you know, a go-between. But you can take the legs out from under that presumption of power by just calling it what it is. Yeah, man, yeah. 
so, uh, so I recently found another aspect of the word officer. Phonetically, it is also an anagram for a Pharisee. Officer, you play around, and it's phonetic. It's not uh, alphabetically precise, but you get the same thing as the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were over adherent to the letter of the law, you know, and that's why cops are basically glorified secretaries, you know, um, with a gun. Uh, but then another aspect of that, the, in language, there's something they call caressing that will uh, oftentimes after a civil war, words from, that had meaning before the civil war will stick around, but they get caressed like a river stone. They, they wear off the edges so that it can be more palatable or socially acceptable. An officer is yet another example of this because before the Civil War, the officer was an overseer. Can I go in on that caressing real quick? It's um, <laughs> It comes from the Greek chorus, chorus which means to caress. And it's right. also where we get in the English word hypochorism, which is to call something by pet names which is technically so like the example would be um hi, highwaymen who jump out and rob you in ancient times now they're called highway patrol <laughs> that's right that's exactly right so yeah what used to be an overseer in the field cracking the whip to make sure you get go to work and follow the letter of the law like a pharisee all of these things are all encapsulated in one word that we use like a title of nobility and we give these guys way more credit than they deserve and call them officers. So that's one other example that the cultural nuance has changed through time. And it's just nice to shine a light back to where it came from originally. You have any other closing thoughts before we uh, wrap it up, Gabe? Fuck the police. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because they're the pole ice, like they're freezing you to a polarity. And then they themselves are the off icers. Right. I don't know. There's definitely some water and some ice in there too. I got one more thing, Emily. I'm coming out to Austin, and I'm wondering: Are you in touch with any Capoeira groups out there? <laughs> oh, I so wish. When when I very first moved to Austin in like 19 in 1999, I was at a party, and some guy came up to me and offered, like he saw me break dancing and whatever. He offered to give me Capoeira lessons. I had no idea what it was at the time. So I he thought it was like some weird, creepy guy hitting on me, right? In hindsight, once I understood what Capueta was and what people who do Capueta like look like, he definitely hit all the, checked all the boxes. But it was another case, like I told the time traveler in the park, like I just ignored him because he was mumbling and I couldn't understand what he was talking about or whatever, right? That sometimes like my, you know, I was like, hey, what the fuck? I dismissed it. Um, no, I don't. I, I know that there is. I know that there is that here, or at least there used to be a very active. There was like this. Oh, I think that coffee house was closed. There's like a coffee house that had like a community center room in the back that they used to practice at called the Rudamaya. It's a famous coffee company. Um, but I can look. But I know that there are. There are. It it, it does exist here. Um, and I wish I could do it, man. I I was at this party once that there was a guy that just captivated the center of the circle with like the craziest like combination of capoeira and break dancing that I had ever seen. And I was just like, if I could do one thing in my life that I, it, it would be that. Like if I, if I had like some magic skill that I wish I could do, it, it's that for sure. So, nice. but yeah. well, when, I, when I come out there, maybe we'll, uh, we'll track them down. We'll go All right. to look see and see if it sparks a fire in you. All right. So, my closing thoughts or Topher's closing thoughts or who's closing thoughts next? We'll uh, we'll give Topher next and then you can roll. No, I'm making him do it. <laughs> do you have anything you want to throw down, buddy? Anything uh, new that you want to tell people I, I about? TopherHQ.com? I, I just want to be clear that I love every single one of yours works. I And I self-admittedly, I don't have enough time to listen to the the – veritable vol volume of information that you're you're giving out and i'm kind Listen of to my audiobook that i did for dylan july's end with black swans that is like the the keys are more properly laid out in that well anything to hear your sultry voice but uh 
Yeah, we're yeah. And I so, do like extra uh, deep like audio voice man book <laughs> voice. <laughs> Yeah, so I just want to be clear on that. Um, I, when I brought that up before, it was just partly because I'm my own laziness is like I don't have, I don't, I haven't put forth enough time to listen all the way through to most things. So I don't even know if you're getting to like a conclusion at the end. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, my Topher HQ website, I guess, is up now. <laughs> Most people interact with me on uh, Instagram at BioCharisma. And uh, the BioCharisma podcast, we have like four four interviews in the can. And I'll be launching that pretty soon. And then, um, yeah, I'm doing the, the Bear National Meetup thing in Missouri at uh, Labor Day weekend. So I got my ticket. Woohoo! So it'll be good to see you there in person. So yeah, that's what's going on on my side. And thank you guys for for inner for this wonderful conversation tonight. Thank you, man. I appreciate you dropping in with us. No problem. Really excited for that Labor Day festival. It's going to be really soon. Yeah, now that I see that river is five 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 five, that's totally going into my presentation. So <laughs> good. Like, yeah, that's, that's make sure awesome. you tell them it's septenary gematria, but don't tell them septenary. Marty Leeds told you because the bears don't like Marty Leeds. Oh, really? I, I, it <laughs> so, doesn't matter. Maybe they're not all the same. You can't make a blanket statement. Yeah, oh, I, I, I can swing them. By the way, that's our guest next week on Vibrant. Oh, great. I like Marty. All right, Emily, tell, tell us anything you're still thinking about that you might want to try to weave the threads together on. So first of all, I want to th uh, thank you for like, well, a, thank you for to Christopher for asking that question because actually I was thinking about that today and wanting to talk about that. It's, I've been tossing around that and that around in conversations, with, you know, like in some of my patron stuff and whatever. And I, I, I I adore all you all of you and you know I'm getting to know some of your work more than I have known before but I wanted to ask the question because I felt like I could hear like I felt like sometimes you ask a question like that and people take some offense and I didn't mean any offense I'm trying to um, like, I'm trying to make sure that we are all um, sort of communicating clearly with each other and that we actually like I I'll, I'll admit guilt sometimes of like having talked out my ass about stuff that I thought that I knew what I was talking about. And I'm not saying anyone necessarily is doing that. Right. But if people are not like picking up what you're putting down, right. Like then we need to start saying, Hey, I don't understand what you're talking about and not be afraid to feel like we're not cool because we don't understand whatever the, the, uh, the latest lingo or whatever it is, is, right? We need to make sure that the message we're trying to convey is actually what people are picking up. So I appreciate you being open to entertaining that conversation, um, you know? And um, I also wanted to say um, what you were talking about with 25 hours of analysis on five hours of content, right? Um, I actually, like, there's a part of me that thinks that that would be a better way forward for us rather than like looking at so many things is if sometimes we just picked like one thing and just drilled all the way down. Because I actually think that we live in a realm that like where, where all paths lead to God to say it right. Or that, that anything that there's there, it, the logos is in everything in everything. Yeah. And part of how we've been, you know, hypnotized or tricked or however we want to think about it is by there's just like, there's so much variety. And I'm person who loves variety, right? Like I like to, I like lots of different things and whatnot, but in terms of what our tool of analysis is, like, you know, we were talking about Kabbalah earlier and we're talking about ancient books. Like a lot of those people worked with like one set of scriptures for their whole life to, to advance or to, to figure stuff out, right? So if for you, your Bible or your Talmud or your Torah or, or Dead Sea Scrolls or whatever is that, what is it? The Moon Knight saga or whatever it is, like then do that because everything like in that sense, like 
I don't know that everything is everything else, but everything is in everything else because of the fractal nature that you were describing before, right? And so there's part like, sometimes I think like I should just go through, cause I've done it a couple of times, like the TV series Fringe. There are so, that shit is loaded with so much symbolism. Like you can see like a picture in the wall in the corner that has like, you know, I went through it a couple of times there. It's so layered and I'm like, well, maybe I should just make my, you know, media all about just breaking that down and analyzing that. But it requires a certain level of like discipline and commitment. I don't know that I would choose that. I might choose something else. But it would be interesting to see people start to like maybe try that approach where like rather than doing all these different shows for six months or a year or whatever, like not going to do anything, but like absolutely analyze that to the nth degree. And I'm not saying that maybe I'm wrong and it's not everything that would be like that, but I have a feeling it's more things than we think. Anything that has captivated you for more than just a short period of time or a fleeting moment probably has a lever, like texture and layers enough to it that if you can't find all the way in or all the way out or the answer you're looking for, the amount that you would learn about yourself and the things you would get to know, the next time, the next thing that was presented to you that did have that potential, you wouldn't miss it. Right. Yes. So, like um, when I think about video games I played as a little, as a young kid or the book series that I was obsessed with, one of them, especially Animorphs. I know if I went and did a deep dive analysis on either of those things, mm -hmm. the level of symbolism that would come out of it would make Amazing. it would be off off the chart. I would have to spend months and months on it, like you said, to right. to actually come through it and get everything that is possible to view. Something about how much attention gets invested into the thing during its creation seems to amplify all of that. And so Hollywood productions, expensively made TV shows, video games require tons of programmers and artists and writers and people running the camera and someone getting them coffee. And so a lot of attention energy is funneled right. into that egregore. And then I don't know, is there an, is there an astral logos that's coming through? Is there like a, right. is there an original spiritual metaverse that got created at some point? And that's why all of our communications on every level and metric seem to be influenced by this one story. I don't know. I That's do. more of a theory. I, and do. I don't necessarily even believe that. It's just kind of what I think about lately. You know, when they show those like connective maps, like the Cambridge Analytica map, or like that one guy who makes like the connection of all the esoteric stuff with Pindar in the middle, but shows how everything is connected, right? Like one of the things that I like to do is not just like pay attention to the story that's being presented in whatever movie or TV show or whatever you're watching but like also see how it connects to all of the other roles that that actor has played. Right. And so like, it's, it's that really takes us to some weird shit in the uh, moon Knight series when we do that. Right. And then think about we're mostly paying attention to the actors, but when you then also did that with the, the director, the producer, every single person who worked on the movie from the, you know, the grip to the caterer or whatever, they're all dragging all their stories, both the real life stories and the roles that were played on the prior movie and the things that happened on a different set that they worked on, like all that's coming kind of like, uh, kind of like genetics in our body where we're sort of connected to, uh, you know, every person who's ever been part of our, um, you know, the ancient genetic line, maybe it's just to everyone that's ever existed before us and now and after us and whatever, but the same thing is going into these stories. They have this like very complex, D genetics or DNA that that makes the body of whatever that piece of work is. And there's stories and stories and stories for days, right? And that's why I think that like wherever you start, if you drill down hard enough, you know, then you can, you can dig, you can find your way in or out or wherever it is we think we're going. I'm not sure I always know, but <laughs> you know, from by doing that. So one thing I'll add to what you just said it has been claimed by like psychology, maybe. I don't know exactly what discipline made the claim, but the theory is that the more options there are, the more information is available to a human being simultaneously and the availability and accessibility of the variety, the level of attention span shortens and shortens and shortens. So, you know, <laughs> 
have we seen a decrease in the base level human attention span post internet post high speed internet is it continually shrinking as more and more and the thing is particular particularizing more and more where the attention was directed for longer period of time at the same tv channel like oh i watch nbc's on tuesday night yeah. must see tv or whatever i don't know if that's the right broadcast station now it's like cnn and cbs they're wishing that they had the numbers that all of these channels like what we do have as an aggregate but it's partic particularized over a lot of channels and Shit. so my point is that when you look at just one thing for a long time and focus your attention on the same thing for a long time a lot blossoms out of it but maybe it's not as valuable to sort of rapid fire be hitting a bunch of stuff in sequence for for a long time when you could just buckle down and dive deep into the one thing maybe it's the attention the quality of the attention and the span of the attention the breadth of it that is actually drawing that out and it doesn't matter what the attention is on the attention is the thing more than the thing is the thing a absolutely and just so you know cnn wishes they had as many viewers as this live stream we've done tonight <laughs> <laughs> so that's like Dave you've had a great crowd thank you everyone for keeping that chat going it's been lively 50 yeah. We had 57 viewers for the first month of uh, CNN Plus or whatever, <laughs> something like that, right? So it's like we're almost double that. Um, yeah, no, no, yeah, absolutely, right? The attention span thing, you know, all, all of that, right? So there's many paths to wherever it is we think we're going. And, and you know, I think we're like, how many books do you have in your house that you haven't read, but you continue to read new articles on the internet every day about the same st political story or the same nonsense story or whatever? There was a part of me, there still is a part of me that like has a small fantasy of like, the power going out for a period of time. So I don't have the option, but to read all the books that are in my house, because I think I have all the answers I need in the books in my house, I just keep ignoring them because of the distraction you're speaking of. Same page, Emily. I, I say a mini prayer like five times a day. Like I wish the lights, I wish they would turn out the lights. <laughs> I got so much reading to do. I got so much to do. The internet off, right? The lights could stay on and I'd probably read, but the internet off. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Chance. I appreciate it. I appreciate you um, and uh, you as well, Gabe. And I have fun every time I hang out with you. I want to thank you guys also for having me on the Weaving Spiders. Um, like I, when when Sean I, you know asked me, I was like, okay, whatever. I wasn't super familiar with all that, and it kind of opened up a new reality for me in some ways. Like I had been in my lane of like people that I communicated with and people I did shows with for a number of years. Um, and I popped over and did that with you guys. And I've done shows with a bunch of other people that I had didn't know before that I've gotten a ton of interesting feedback from my audience about having had conversations with you all. And I look forward to having you on sometime, Gabe and whatnot, but it's sort of opened up a new window. Um, for me to ask different sets of questions and challenge some things, both of you all, of my existing audience and of myself. And I feel like I can do that. I feel like there's open communication and we can say whatever we want and it's rad. And thank you very much. Absolutely. I can't yeah, wait. I wanted to say too, I, I appreciate you being here. And in particular, that one line of questioning about like, where's the value? That is a super good question. I really appreciate that. Uh, like that doesn't annoy me at all. To be asked that question to me that's like oh that fires me up to get clear <laughs> get more clear about it you know because like i want to offer value and that's my whole goal i don't want this to just be throw away you know empty calorie well, entertainment you offer tons of value lots of people do right and so when when there's also these like little parts where it's like well i get everything else why don't i get that Right. Like I just decided I'm just going to ask the question so that now I can get clarity instead of just like having that thought. Well, everything else is so rad and clear. Why don't I understand this? And so I'm just starting to go like if I have a question, I'm going to ask it. If I have something to say, I'm going to say it and assume that everyone here has done their work and is a grown up and we can have a conversation about it and actually get somewhere. So thank you. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, tell them where to find you. 
Um, you, you can find me on uh, YouTube on uh, Emily Moyer. My website is emilycmoyer.com. You can link to all the ways you can get my vast cornucopia of media stuff. Um, if you'd like to have a nutrition consultation, I do. Uh, I bring a lot of sort of esoterics and interesting stuff to that. I also do storytelling and sort of lifestyle design stuff, or sometimes people just want to have like a really fucking weird conversation with me. I do that too. That's all available there. I'm on Rockfin, Locals, Patreon, all that jazz. I'm hard to miss. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll wrap this up. You're welcome back anytime. If you want to schedule one, tell me. If you want to jump in as a caller, just tell me in the chat and we'll get you up here. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. I can't All right, wait catch for everyone tomorrow. Margaritas. I make really good ones. <laughs> um, we're wrap speaking of Moon Knight, we're wrapping that up tomorrow night, episode six of Moon Knight. Same bat channel, same bat time. Same bat show. <laughs> same bat show. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. See you on Telegram. Join our Telegram group. Check the links in the show notes for description to everything that you might want to find a link to hit me up for sound healing it's really good two weeks booked out right now so if you want to do it book me soon check out my audiobook get more knowledge get the code all right that's all my plugs bye bye good night love you all <laughs> good night guys <laughs>